Okay, I think we're all set. Welcome to the 134th Global Star Party. We're going to get started now. This is all about learning more about the planet you're standing on. <laughs> When you think of wildfires, you may think of destruction, skeletal forests, property loss, and lives forever changed. But fires can also bring rejuvenation. They can renew ecosystems, nourish the soil, and foster new growth. But climate change is causing these fires to burn larger, longer, and more often. These larger and more frequent fires damage ecosystems, disrupt communities, and can even influence the climate. So understanding the basics of wildfires and how they're impacted by climate change is key to our ability to predict where and when fires are likely to occur, as well as remotely detect and track wildfires once they ignite, and ultimately mitigate their impacts on human health and the environment. This is Wildfires 101. The first thing you should know is that wildfires require three key ingredients, fuel to burn, the right conditions, and a source of ignition. But what does that actually mean? So fuel, like needles, leaves, or wood on the forest floor, is rarely a fire's limiting factor. And the conditions that are favorable for fire, like hot, dry, and windy days, are becoming more and more common as our climate changes. Under these fire weather conditions, fuels dry out and become more susceptible to burn. As for a source of ignition, well, most of the wildfires that NASA detects from space are started by people. Others, usually in the Arctic and boreal regions, are ignited by lightning strikes. NASA can track these conditions and inform land managers when an area appears prone to wildfire. Every day, NASA is able to detect thousands of new fires from space. Along with our partners at NOAA, we use both polar orbiting and geostationary satellites to get insight as to the structure and evolution of a fire. Geostationary satellites remain fixed in relationship to the globe, giving us new images of one hemisphere every 5 to 15 minutes. However, the resolution is usually coarser than that of polar orbiting satellites, which will pass over a fire twice per day. From over 500 miles above the Earth, these orbiting satellites will detect and characterize thermal anomalies, locations on the Earth's surface that are hotter than their neighbors that can indicate burning associated with new or existing fire events. Importantly, these instruments can detect fires at night, a time when wildfires typically lay down and smolder. Since the majority of large wildfires last for multiple days, the ability to track them both day and night is instrumental to helping <coughs> land managers combat the blazes. But it's not just the fire itself that's dangerous. Wildfire smoke can travel for thousands of miles, having the ability to blanket large swaths of a continent from a single wildfire. Smoke from wildfires can reach high altitudes, between three to six miles, and travel with prevailing winds. This smoke can linger in the air for several weeks, changing the chemistry of the atmosphere and reducing the amount of sunlight reaching the surface. Smoke that gets trapped near the ground severely impacts the air quality in surrounding communities. And poor air quality can last for months as large fires continue to smolder even after the fire itself has been contained. Climate change is not only impacting the size and intensity of wildfires, but also their frequency in some regions. NASA has over 22 years of daily fire data to track wildfire trends. This is important to get a sense of how fire regimes, the historical frequency of wildfires in a region, are changing over time. Understanding an ecosystem's fire regime is important because in many instances, wildfire is essential to maintain a mixture of younger and older vegetation. However, when fires occur too frequently or with increased severity, it can have devastating effects like destroying habitat, changing soil chemistry, and clogging waterways, not to mention releasing greenhouse gases like CO2 and aerosols into the atmosphere. NASA can study wildfires' impact on the landscape by measuring burn scars, as well as tracking vegetation loss and rate of regrowth. 
Having an accurate assessment of a landscape post-fire is a key part of understanding how ecosystems recover over time. NASA's ability to not only track wildfires, but also the conditions that lead to them, is essential to our ability to mitigate their impacts. We're working with land managers and those on the front lines to give them the tools, including near real-time data, to help them make decisions to minimize the risks and plan for the future. Hello everyone and welcome to the 134th Global Star Party. I'm Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And our theme tonight is knowing Earth. And uh, although astronomers spend a lot of time looking up into the sky and studying planets, uh, we sometimes surprisingly know very little about the planet that we're standing on. And so uh, as of um, this modern era, we have an incredible array of uh, space-based satellites and we're collecting data and looking at this planet as we never have before. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to bring you our uh, program and uh, we're going to turn this over to David Levy uh, for some commentary and uh, some poetry. Well, thank you. Thank you, Scott. And it's good to be here especially on a, uh, with everything that's happening on our own earth right now. I have two poems for you today. The first is pretty obvious relating to, uh, to the planet earth. It's for T.S. Eliot's Little Golden from his four quartets. We shall not cease from exploration and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. For most of us, we observe from the earth our home. And that's why it is so important to have as a theme this week, our home, the earth. There's something else happening that from which we observe from the earth and that is Halley's Comet. I wanted to let you all know that next, I think it's at the end of, sometime during December, Halley's Comet is going to reach its aphelion, its farthest point between the sun and the comet. It'll be, it is well beyond the orbit of Neptune right now, and it is rapidly approaching its perihelion. And so for the quote that I have today is going to be from Starlight Nights, when, where Leslie Peltier writes about Halley's Comet. Within historic times, 28 visits by Halley's Comet have been recorded. It's more than that now. On an early trip, it witnessed the defeat of Attila's Huns in AD 451. It arrived in time to preside over the Norman conquest in 1066. In the year 1456, the menacing appearance of the comet so alarmed Pope, Pope Calixtus, Calixtus that he decreed several days of prayer and established the midday Angelus. With a great clanging of bells, he then besought the comet to visit its wrath solely on the invading Turks. In 1607, the comet was watched by both Shakespeare and Kepler. And I like to think that it was also seen by Captain John Smith and Pocahontas in the frontier skies of Jamestown. On the following trip around, on his following trip around in 1682, the comet was observed by Halley himself, who probed into its periodic past and bequeathed to it an honored name, that it can bear with pride throughout the solar system. By 1835, when it returned, affairs of Earth had speeded up. Many a canal boat traveler looking down could see the comet glowing on the surface of this highway. Mm -hmm. Humanity himself had taken to the skies when the comet appeared in 1910, for it was making fledgling flights of perhaps 100 miles. 
In 1986, our historic visitor was visited in turn. For in that year, several spacecraft from the Earth will hold a rendezvous, held a rendezvous with Halley's Comet out in space. And he ends it with, who would venture to foretell the wonders and achievements will the comet, which the comet will witness in that distant year of 2061 and 2062? Or will humanity itself prove periodic? Will the Huns be back again? Thank you, Scott, and back to you. Thank you very much, David. That's great. Um, uh, so I know that uh, many of us are getting ready to go to see the annular eclipse. Uh, David, where are you heading? I will be in um, Plattsburgh, uh, where we're only expecting to get about a 20% eclipse. And my feeling is that even an annular eclipse, the ring of fire around the, moon, the smaller than average moon, yeah. is a partial eclipse, even if you see the annular phase. So I don't mind trying to see it from Plattsburgh. Okay. But next year, I will be with you for the total on for April the total. 8th. We'll be in Texas for yeah. that. Yes, yeah. sir. Well, that's great, David. Well, you have a great time in Plattsburgh, and uh, we'll see you on the next Global Star Party. Thanks. So Thank much. you. Thank you. All right. Um, our next speaker is the vice president of the Astronomical League, uh, Chuck Allen. Chuck is one of the leaders of the largest uh, federation of astronomy clubs in the world, I think maybe of all time. Uh, they have over 300 clubs under their umbrella. Uh, uh, tens of thousands of members uh, belong to the Astronomical Club. I don't know how many members may have belonged at all times because the organization is over 70 years old, 75 years old, actually. So um, uh, we always enjoy having Chuck on. He is uh, a fascinating individual, a uh, great sense of humor uh, as well. And um, um, I'm really happy to have you on, Chuck. So let me uh, bring you onto the stage. Here you go. Okay. There Thank you go. very much. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thanks. Uh, I'm just going to cover some fun facts about the planet Earth, if I may. So I'm going to share a screen here and go straight to it. What you're looking at here is called the blue marble. It's a photo that was taken uh, by the Apollo 17 astronauts. And one thing that you need to understand about this blue marble that we live on is that it's the largest of the terrestrial worlds in our solar system. And it's also the densest planet in our solar system. Um, it formed, of course, four and a half billion years ago, orbits the sun at between 91.4 and 94.5 million miles. And it's about 7,917 miles in diameter and about 10 miles uh, less in diameter measured from pole to pole. So there's a little oblateness to the Earth, a little pear-shaped uh, quality to it. The size of this uh, blue marble was first measured in 240 BC with 10% accuracy by a gentleman who lived right up in this area here in Egypt, Eratosthenes, uh, with an incredible experiment. You should look it up if you're not familiar with it. Seen from one particular angle, we look very much indeed like a water planet. Uh, the entire surface of the Earth uh, features 197 million square miles, 71% of which is covered by water, 29% by land. Um, if we took all the water and put it into a cube, it would be a cube uh, containing 332 million cubic miles of water. That would be a cube 695 miles on a side. Our planet has an axial tilt compared to its orbit around the sun. 23.5 degrees, the North Pole, of course, pointing toward Polaris in Ursa Minor and the South Pole near Sigma Octantis in the Southern end. We call this orbital plane that we're in the ecliptical plane. Uh, all planets have one and they're not the same as the Earth, uh, but of course we regard ours as being the benchmark. So we call ours the ecliptical plane and measure the other uh, planes of the other planets orbits according to ours. This uh, axial tilt that we have, of course, is responsible for our seasons. In December, the southern hemisphere of the Earth is exposed to the direct rays of the sun, whereas the northern hemisphere uh, gets oblique rays and less radiation. Whereas in summer in the north, 
the Northern Hemisphere gets the direct rays and the Southern Hemisphere receives much less. Now, this is rather interesting because the axial tilt is much more responsible for the seasons than the distance from the sun is. In point of fact, uh, the sun is considerably closer uh, to the sun, 3 million miles closer, in fact, uh, on January 4th each year. That would be in mid-winter uh, uh, mid, uh, for the Northern Hemisphere. The fact that our, ax, that our axis points to Polaris now does not mean that it always will. Uh, in point of fact, the Earth's uh, axis precesses, much like a gyroscope will precess uh, as it spins, so does the Earth's uh, axis. This occurs over a period of 25,700 years. As I mentioned a moment ago, the planets have different planes in their orbits around the sun. They're fairly consistent. Now that Pluto's out of the mix, uh, we define our plane of the ecliptic as this blue dotted line here. And we measure the inclination of all the other uh, planets in relation to ours. You'll notice there's a black line here called the invariable plane, and that's the average plane of the mass of all the planets in the solar system. And that becomes very important in defining what a North Pole is. A lot of people think a North Pole is measured by the right hand rule, where you stick your thumb up on your right hand and curl your fingers around. This would show the Earth as having a North Pole, where in fact our North Pole is. But in point of fact, the North Poles are defined according to whether the pole is aimed above the plane of the invariable plane of our solar system. So if we look at a distant galaxy, we draw a perpendicular through the middle of the galaxy, the galactic plane, uh, the one that points above our invariable plane is their North Galactic Pole. The orbital poles of the planets all point uh, toward the constellation Draco. Uh, what that means is that if you look at a perpendicular to the plane of the Earth's orbit, it points to this point here in Draco. The other planets, since they're tilted a little differently in their orbits, have uh, orbital poles that are a little bit different, but all still in the constellation of Draco. And the sun's north pole points to Draco as well. Okay, speaking of poles, uh, we need to talk about the Earth's poles because we have several of them. We have a geographic pole, a north magnetic pole, a north geomagnetic pole, and of course, corresponding south, south magnetic and south geomagnetic poles as well. The North uh, Geographic Pole was first reached on April 6, 1909 by Matthew Henson uh, and Robert Peary uh, and four Inuits. Robert Peary and Matthew Henson were Americans. Uh, Matthew Henson, the first African-American to reach the pole along with Robert Peary. And uh, this uh, conquest of the North Pole was somewhat disputed over the years due to some navigational discrepancies in the record keeping. Uh, nonetheless, it has generally been regarded as the first conquest of the pole, and it caused Roald Admonson of Norway to, when he got news of this, it caused him to decide not to try to go for the North Pole, but to go to the South Pole instead, which he did not have permission to do from his sponsors, most notably uh, Ernest Shackleton. But uh, Mr. Admonson did pursue the South Pole. Uh, and on December 14, 1911, uh, he achieved the pole in a race against Robert Scott of Great Britain, uh, who arrived at the South Pole 28 days later and who died in the effort to uh, return home uh, on the Arctic uh, ice sheet. The North and South Poles, by the way, are not fixed in the planet itself. If you looked at the seabed, 13,000 feet deep at the North Pole, and you saw a pole sticking up that represented the actual location of the pole, it would only be accurate for a little while because over a period of 433 days, it wanders around about 30 feet in two different directions in a circular pattern. This is called a Chandler wobble. And the fact that the axis actually shifts within the Earth is caused by gravitational effects from the other planets and our moon. Now, the North Magnetic Pole is a massive wanderer. I'm sure many of you are aware that over the last several years, it has taken a real uh, uh, fast trip north and uh, 
towards Siberia. Uh, this is caused, of course, by shifting uh, ferromagnetic materials in the Earth's mantle. Um, and the interesting thing about the North Magnetic Pole is that it's supposed to be the point and is the point where the magnetic field lines of the Earth enter the surface of the Earth. In other words, where your compass would be useless. Unfortunately, the North Magnetic Pole of anything is where the field lines come out. So actually, the North Magnetic Pole that we see on this map here is actually the Earth's South Magnetic Pole. If you want to prove that to yourself, take a magnet with a red arrow on the side that points north, and that's the North Pole of your magnet, and see if it points north. It will. Now, it wouldn't do that unless it was pointing to an opposite uh, charge. And so it is an indication that it's pointing, in fact, to our south magnetic pole. The geomagnetic pole is a, in, currently in Ellesmere Island and is much more stable. And the only way I can define the north geomagnetic, geomagnetic pole is to say that the overall effect of the Earth's magnetic field in space is a line running through the center of the Earth and the aurora center on that north geomagnetic pole and south geomagnetic pole. The actual magnetic poles that we talked about a moment ago are affected by ferromagnetic flows near the surface of the Earth. And uh, so they're a little different and that uh, magnetic pole does not run through the center of the Earth. Very strange. We have some interesting mountains on Earth, but what's the tallest, biggest one? Uh, several have claims to this. Uh, actually, the tallest mountain on Earth, ignoring water, is Mauna Kea, which supports our Keck and Subaru telescopes. It's only 13,803 feet above sea level, but it's actually a mountain that's 33,500 feet tall, measured from the bottom of the ocean, its base to its summit. The tallest mountain base to summit above sea level is Denali, Mount McKinley in Alaska. Uh, it sits on a plain that's only 2,000 feet above sea level, but rises to 20,194 feet. So 18,000 feet of it uh, rises above its base plain. The furthest point from the center of the earth, a mountain that I've uh, been on, uh, is Chimborazo in uh, Ecuador. Uh, it's 20,548 feet above sea level, much shorter than Mount Everest in that respect. But because of the equatorial bulge of the earth, its summit, is 7,096 feet further from the center of the earth than the summit of Mount Everest. So this mountain too has a claim to being the tallest mountain uh, in the world. But the real winner, of course, above sea level is Mount Everest, 29,031.7 feet and growing at four millimeters per year because the Indian sub subcontinent is still ramming into the Asian continent. Uh, in 241,000 years, another mountain that's growing faster than Mount Everest may surpass it. That mountain is Nanga Parbat. The first to climb this mountain, of course, were Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay in uh, May of 1953. They were a lucky backup summit team that got the green light after the lead team had oxygen uh, equipment failure. Here's a comparison of Earth's mountains with the mountains of a lot of other worlds in our solar system. Bear in mind, again, the Earth is the densest and largest of the terrestrial worlds. So salt doesn't pile up as high here as it does on the moon and other smaller worlds. Mount Everest is kind of puny down here. We can put Mauna Kea above it if we ignore the sea. Uh, but notice that Verona Roops on Miranda is taller. The Lim Mountain on Oberon is taller. Hua Salamontes on Io, 59,000 feet. The equatorial bulge, bulge on the Yapita, 63,000 feet. The mighty Olympus Mons, 69,841 feet, but possibly beaten by Rhea Silvia Vesta, which has a mountain rising above the average radius of the planet, 72,178 feet. The deepest point on the Earth's surface, of course, uh, is uh, the Challenger Deep. And the Challenger Deep uh, is an extraordinary place, 35,856 feet deep. That's about 6.8 miles. And at the bottom of this abyss, uh, the pressure is 1,086 atmospheres. That's eight tons per square inch. Uh, it was first visited by Jacques Picard and Don Walsh in, in 1960. Uh, 
in a, a steel ball being suspended by essentially a canvas bag full of gasoline. This was called a Trieste. Um, and it took them four hours and 47 minutes to reach uh, the bottom. Amazingly, when they got to 30,000 feet, the outer plexiglass part of their window cracked and they went ahead and went on down to the bottom another mile deep. I, I find that absolutely extraordinary, but they did it anyway. Their record has been surpassed by a few feet. Uh, American Victor Vescovo in 2019 went to 35,853 feet, which is within a couple feet of the deepest estimated point. The lowest point on the surface of the earth is the Dead Sea shore of uh, Israel and Jordan. Uh, it's 13,800, uh, uh, excuse me, 1,385 feet below sea level. Uh, their marker here on the Jordanian shore is a little off. The hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth right here in the United States, the Furnace Creek Ranch in uh, Death Valley. Uh, on July 10th, 1913, a temperature of 134.1 degrees. And the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth at the Vostok Station on July 21st, uh, 1983 at minus 128.6 degrees. That's a range of 262.7 degrees. But some people who've gone to Antarctica have experienced slightly more of a range than that. This is a picture of the Admonson South Pole Station. And uh, here's the famous dome and many of the working buildings. Here is the ceremonial pole, and down here in the lower left, the actual geographic pole, which moves slightly because of the shifting of the surface ice. Um, they have a 300 club where you can get into a sauna with no clothes on except boots, uh, and they get the sauna up to uh, 200 degrees Fahrenheit, very dry sauna. And when the temperature in the midwinter is minus 100 outside, they run around the ceremonial pole and back. Those were bold try for the geographic pole. The interior of the earth is something I liken to a hot pudding with the skin on top of it. Our crust, of course, on which we live, only one to 60 miles thick. Beneath that, down to a depth of 1,800 miles, a mantle of silicate rock that reaches temperatures at the bottom of the mantle of over 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Below that, an outer core of liquid, iron and nickel, reaching temperatures close to 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And then at the bottom, in the center, uh, a, an inner core of solid nickel and iron alloys reaching temperatures of 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than the surface of the sun. And then on the surface, what about us? Uh, well, interestingly, this right chart I want to point out really is expanded from this little corner of the left-hand chart. So ignore the right chart for a moment. This is a measurement of biomass and tons of carbon. Plants responsible for 450 billion tons of carbon biomass on the planet Earth. Bacteria, 70 billion tons. Fungi, 12 billion tons. Single-celled uh, microbes, 8 billion tons. Uh, then we have the uh, little square down here. We're going to expand it to arthropods, just 1 billion tons, fish, 700 million tons, livestock, 100 million, and then humans come in at 60 million. Nematodes come in at 20 million, and I'm personally offended by the fact that nematodes are responsible for one third as much biomass as we humans are. That's really incredible to me. Birds come in at 2 million, very small amount of biomass in total measurement. And if we just look at the biomass of mammals on the surface of the Earth, uh, this rather amazing view comes up. The 62% of the global mammal biomass is livestock, uh, cattle, pigs, sheep, horses, buffalo, and so forth. And wild mammals, only 4% uh, percent of that. And the effect uh, of humans raising livestock and increasing our population on wild animals in the world is rather dramatic. You can see that from 100,000 years ago, we had a two, 20 million tons of carbon biomass assigned to wild animals. That dropped to 15 million 10,000 years ago, 10 million in 1900, it's down to 3 million now, just 2% of the mammal biomass. And of course, we have a moon, 2,159 miles in diameter, 
average distance 238,855 miles. I had the privilege of seeing three launches of Apollo missions, 14, 15, and 17 from Merritt Island. And uh, one of the advantages of going to Astronomical League conventions, and our next one is in Kansas City next year, is you can meet people who've done amazing things. Like this gentleman on the right is Harrison Schmidt. He was the geologist who landed on the moon with Apollo 17 and helped us get a better idea of how the moon formed. When I met him, I said to him, hey, I got to see, I got to see your launch. And he responded, uh, I didn't. Uh, but what he did see, though, is something that we all need to see. And that is the Earth as our only planet uh, that's reachable in any short period of time and a haven that's worth protecting. Scott, thank you very much. Wow. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I am uh, excited for the next uh, global or the next um, astronomical league convention. Uh, you know, and uh, as we get closer to that event, we will be uh, keeping you updated with uh, speaker information and how to attend uh, both in person and virtually as well. So, um, all right. Thanks again, Chuck. Uh, let me. Uh, Take a quick look here. All right, uh, we have a new uh, presenter, although she's not completely new to the Global Star Party, Anna Katerina Avila. And Anna was the translator for Nicolina that was on our Global Star Party. She uh, is a, a young, very young uh, astronomer who is researching asteroids. Uh, but uh, Anna is a biologist uh, and she is using uh, space-borne satellites to analyze the Earth. And uh, Anna, thank you for coming on to uh, Global Star Party and giving us a presentation. Hey, Scott. First, thank you so much for inviting me. Honestly, it was a lot of fun to put this together. And um, uh, let me know if you can hear me okay. I hope it's hope it's fun for everyone as well. Uh, sure and uh, yeah, also really awesome for Marcelo, uh, who you're going to hear from a little later tonight, who, right. you know, yeah, so I also have to thank him for being here and for like, you know, having a chance he to was, speak. Uh, he was one of your mentors uh, when you were uh, young, is that right? Uh, to this day, actually, uh, it's kind of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm always a bit baffled by how much he, you know, he, I, I still get to learn from him uh, as, at this point. Um, and uh, yeah, he was definitely, um, I, I, you know, he's definitely guilty of the of me following my path in science. Is definitely a big part of it. Is his fault. That's great. That's so, great. Um, yeah. I um, hope that this uh, it shows okay. I, I took also I, I took the quick freedom after the very interesting talk. Thank you so much mm -hmm. uh, to add like just right now really quickly this infographic from a brilliant science illustrator that I know. Uh, following up on a little bit of that, that I was thinking that it was like also very interesting, very like new take on that like those shocking numbers of just the dimension of livestock and the biomass of different parts of life so thank you for bringing that up um so um actually okay let me see if i can open this um i hope everyone can see okay um so uh as uh was mentioned i am a biologist and i am using satellites um to do very large scale research on earth um and I am hoping that um, we can uh, leave this talk a little bit more uh, excited about how satellites I find to be like very underrated parts of the um, astronomy and astronautics discussions. Um, so by the end of this talk, I hope that you have a little bit more knowledge on the history of Earth observation, um, but I'm going to delve a little bit more into types of satellites and how they work. Um, and then we can uh, look into a little bit of like knowing how they, knowing these different types of satellites, what do they apply, what do we apply them on, so what do we use them for, and uh, how can they help us in the future going forward. Um, so I understand that you must be surprised that there is a biologist speaking to you about this. Um, so I hope you hold on to that question, and this should be clear to you by the end of the talk. <laughs> Um, so
So, you know, if speaking to an audience of people who are very interested in science and astronomy, I am sure you're familiar uh, with this image and with uh, this epic speech by Carl Sagan. Uh, so that dot, that's here, that's home, that's us. Um, and may, that may be um, a lot of people's first thought as it comes to Earth observation, those beautiful images um, also as Earthrise and um, as the blue marble that also was mentioned in the, in the previous talk. Um, and uh, the thing is, looking at the Earth is not only a, an amazing way to insight wonder and uh, beauty, um, but it started as very much a goal for um, trying to inform decisions that are being made here on Earth. Um, so, and these efforts have started back in the space race and the very first of them were actually not that successful. Um, so this is the very first picture of Earth that was taken from, the or from orbit. And um, it was described that this actually was an image of the Pacific Ocean. I don't know who looks at this and realizes, oh yeah, that's the Pacific Ocean. Um, but that's how it started. Um, but surprisingly, uh, actually, the first um, civilian Earth observation satellite. So after those, those few first um, efforts, um, then uh, there was an, um, a dedication from, the, from NASA um, and uh, the USGS to try and develop tools that would allow us to learn about the Earth. So the very first satellites gave us some information about the atmosphere, um, but um, the very first civilian satellite that was observing the Earth uh, that was launched in 1971, started collecting information in 1972, started is Landsat, which, is, which you may or may not have heard about, which is very widely used to this day. So I find that to be so impressive, how this mission that was started so many years ago uh, with this intention of informing decisions on Earth uh, has succeeded so much that to this day it is so widely used um, in many different applications. Uh, so Landsat 9 now um, is already in operation and Landsat Next coming up soon. So it seems like it's going to keep going and keep improving. Um, Landsat 5, you can see it was so long, it actually get, gets the Guinness World Record for the longest operating Earth observing uh, satellite. Uh, so, and it's actually what I use for my research as well. So um, the first thought as a lot of scientists have on regarding, regarding the earth is Landsat. Now, so how does Landsat work? Um, how, what kind of technology is so good that like since the 1970s, it's still being used. Um, so it is a, what we call a passive multispectral sensor, meaning that it is receiving the um, energy uh, that is being reflected from the Earth, uh, from the sun. So um, it's multispectral, meaning that it has a bunch of discrete bands in the electromagnetic spectrum of the light that is reflected back to it. So um, it receives um, information within only a few discrete bands. Um, now Landsat 9 has nine bands. Um, so that is very informative as a sort of a fingerprint, um, different features of the earth. So different coverings, clouds, snow and ice, water are going to absorb and reflect different wavelengths of light. And uh, this allows us to then, according to how much is being reflected on these different discrete bands that it's observing, we can identify what class, what class of um, what class of land are we looking at? So um, Landsat is high resolution and it has led us to these like 30 meter images um, that are just absolutely beautiful. And uh, it's to me impressive how this kind of technology um, is able to provide us like the same just reflected image from the sun. Um, and the same multispectral, like although more bands, but still um, has been allowing us to look at the earth like this for so long. Um, now, um, other multispectral satellites have been released ever since, of course, Landsat's not the only one. 
Uh, MODIS, um, as was mentioned before, is very widely used for fire um, detection. Also Sentinel from the European Space Agency. Um, and uh, the thing is, of course, there's different resolutions, right? So you can see here, uh, 300 meters, which is more of like what you'd expect. It's even smaller, MODIS is even larger than this. Um, and Landsat is very high resolution. Um, so you may be wondering, well, then why do we even bother releasing something with a lower resolution if we already have Landsat? Um, turns out there's a trade-off between return time, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm glad that Scott showed that video in the beginning already, sets a nice introduction into what I'm talking about. So for example, in blue here, you see the footprints, what we call the snapshots that MODIS is taking, which you can see are very large um, and uh, gives about 500 meter resolution. And the tiny ones are Landsat. So 30 meters, beautiful images. The thing is Landsat comes back every 16 days and MODIS comes back every one or two days. Um, so there's usually a trade-off between return time, so temporal resolution, and the spatial resolution, so how big are your pixels. Uh, this matters because, of course, if you're trying to just classify in you know, a land or the way the forest grows, 16 days is not that big of a deal. But if you're trying to catch new fires, 16 days, a lot of land has been burned. So uh, this is a very interesting trade-off. These are some, um, some um, a new strategy to try and work through this is being employed right now by some private companies is the use of constellations, uh, which you may be familiar with. So they solve the trade-off of return space with resolution by having multiple satellites that, uh, that achieve the same region um, more frequently. And you can have incredibly high res uh, resolution remote sensing of 30 centimeters up to 15 if the proper machine learning tools are applied. So 15 centimeters, um, <laughs> which is insane. Um, so um, let me see this. Okay. So that was, uh, you know, the workhorse of remote sensing, multispectral optical. Uh, right, so here we're looking at now active remote sensing. So active remote sensing means it doesn't rely on sunlight, which is amazing. It works at night as well, um, as the satellites emit their the the pulses. They emit the signals and they measure the return of the signals as they reach the Earth's surface and return to the sensor. Um, so the main ones are lidar and synthetic aperture radar, which we're going to talk about a little bit more. So sonar, which is what the um, dolphins and uh, bats have, which is basically a similar process of measuring the return of sound waves, uh, and like this measuring their distance to an object. Uh, STAR does the same thing with, so that's radar um, with um, this, with radio waves, so very large wavelengths. And LIDAR does the same thing with laser. So it's around the near infrared band. Um, so SAR, as I mentioned before, in a similar bat-like, dolphin-like way, will emit these radio uh, waves towards the Earth and measure the intensity and the time to return by these waves. So like this, um, and also depending on um, the polarization of these waves, uh, it can tell the structure of what it's looking at. So it's very useful for telling structure and moisture as that as water can also affect the way that these um, that these radio waves return. Um, also, uh, as there is um, a trade-off um, uh, between uh, the, the larger the wavelength um, is the um, you're going to have more ability of these of these radio waves to penetrate through things like leaves, for example, and reach the ground. Uh, so they have different uses as you're talking about measuring the volume and the density of vegetation. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a trade, so there's a, um, there, this is very large wavelengths, right? Uh, the thing is, if you have very large wavelengths, you need very, very large antennas um, to have acceptable resolution. So um, it's usually those satellites are released. It's uh, definitely a struggle to get them up there with their enormous antennas and uh, it's kind of a beautiful effort. Um, so 
Okay. Uh, so the image, um, so you can have more of a structural idea of what's going on, on the ground. This, for example, is Amazonia deforestation. Um, so a space of 10 years, this is collected by JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. Um, and uh, also this may be a familiar site to anyone that has been to Paris. Here's the Eiffel Tower uh, by a satellite by the Canadian Space Agency. Um, LIDAR, as I mentioned, similarly is able to, um, is measures the return um, of lasers that it's emits towards the earth. Um, and um, the uh, very interesting thing is that you can also tell structure from LIDAR. Um, and it has much smaller fingerprints, right? Uh, this is also from the Japanese Space Agency. Um, so by, it's also comes, it can also come from airborne sources. So depending on the return, you can tell the whole canopy structure of a forest, which is um, very helpful if you're trying to determine biomass density. Um, and an amazing mission that we have right now going on is JEDI. Uh, which is also brilliantly named. It's in the International Space Station. And uh, it's the first high resolution laser. Uh, so this you can clearly see, um, like in an American example, how it can tell the density of the canopy and the, and the height. Uh, so we can have scans of forests all over the world. Um, and uh, it was supposed to be retired from, from, the, from the space station in January this year. Um, but thankfully, there was a big effort from scientists all over the planet to beg NASA to please keep it. We need it. Um, uh, people sent slides. I sent one. I am so sorry for whoever had to sit through all of these lives of scientists all over the place begging them not to get rid of Jedi. And it's still going on. So I hope the mission will continue for a long time. Um, one interesting application of this, for example, is this paper that came out less than a week ago, four days ago, it's fresh out of the oven in Science Magazine, um, showing how LIDAR, a combination of, of, um, of satellite and airborne, can help us see archeological sites that were hidden under the forest. Um, and uh, this now there's over 10,000 pre-Columbian uh, earthworks that are being um, discovered through LIDAR. Uh, so it's um, quite impressive. Um, another one that is also in the in the space station, besides um, you know besides structure and uh, color, we can also look at things like temperature, for example. So it is a radiometer, meaning that it measures um, different. It can tell different intensities of light that is re that is being received at different bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, and uh, it's also recently released and people are also very excited about it as it can tell the temperature of soil and the temperature of plants and the way that they transpire. Um, very useful in a world with changing climate. Uh, to, just to mention two missions that are coming up that are groundbreaking and that I'm very excited about is a hyperspectral um, imager from NASA, which you can think of it as sort of a multispectral with so many bands. When Lensat has nine bands, this will have hundreds, um, and uh, which allows us to classify land much easier. May come in 2024, we don't know, it's been postponed. And the ESA biomass, which is going to be um, very uh, large wavelength um, uh, radar. So it's going to allow us to understand biomass of very dense forests much easier now. Uh, so um, then you must already have some suspicion on why there is an ecologist that is speaking to you about this. Um, if you look into NASA's YouTube channel, surprisingly, you're going to find that a lot of their content is actually regarding remote sensing and it's actually regarding applications of the, of their work. Um, in JPL, um, they hire people from all sorts of fields, um, to make sure that these, tutorials are available and that this data is easily accessible uh, for many different applications. Uh, the most evident one that people are most familiar with is weather and climate. So by looking at flooding and clouds, you can get not only a daily weather app, but also monitor air quality. Um, so um, as you can tell, the um, aerosols and the spectrum of the atmosphere 
uh, anticipate storms. And for example, here, the Libya floods, um, this is from very high resolution um, and uh, anticipate storms coming up. Um, also geology as my lab mate who works with volcanoes will very, be very happy to tell you, um, you can tell such minute changes in surface that a few centimeters uh, that changes because of an earthquake or because of even the movement of, la of lava underneath a volcano. Um, you can monitor disasters and you can plan mining activities um, and study volcanic activity. So uh, that's still very widely used. Um, oceanography. So this is literally the data that another one of my lab mates uses um, as she studies phytoplankton. Um, and uh, this is from Modus Aqua. Uh, so there is another one of the ones that was mentioned before, uh, a cousin of the satellite that studies fires. Um, and she studies algal blooms. So um, if with this, you can tell the productivity of oceans, but more than help, which helps plan fisheries um, and ocean conservation, of course. Uh, but what is very interesting is if you have very high resolution satellite, you can also detect illegal ships. Um, and manage high traffic ports or high traffic areas like the Panama Canal, for example. Um, and that's where I am personally involved in, land use monitoring. So um, by classifying land use type and crop health, uh, we can plan agriculture. Right now I'm using this information to help understand how forests grow after um, they are regrowing on land that's been abandoned by agricultural practices. And what is very funny is at some point I was in a family reunion talking about my research with my cousin, who is a lawyer and uh, who is working on land registering in Brazil. And I passively mentioned, oh, yeah, well, I'm working with Landsat data from my Bioma source. It's my Biomas, I'm working with that, too. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, so it turns out he's using the same tool as I am to make sure that the legal registry of land in Brazil is being done correctly and that people that are cropping and using the land are paying the appropriate taxes. Uh, so all sorts of different applications of the same material. Um, and where it becomes very obvious, my personal interest on forestry. So beyond monitoring deforestation, fires, as was mentioned before, and the health of trees, uh, you can also at this point uh, literally understand biodiversity distributions of different species of trees um, and uh, also estimate carbon sequestration. Uh, so the biodiversity applications of remote sensing is cutting edge in ecology right now, the hottest topic. Um, and uh, for example, here's um, one application which you can tell different species of trees. Um, this is the data that I'm using for my research that tells which area has been burned based on Landsat. Um, and um, also, this is, I, I took a screenshot of this from my, um, from my research project. This is um, biomass data across the Brazilian Amazon basin uh, from the European Space Agency. Um, it comes from radar and LIDAR together. Um, so, um, you know, so this ability to look at color, structure, composition, moisture, um, this allows us to do the kind of research that was unthinkable in, a not to distant past. Um, this view into the past, this view into like instantaneous uh, large scale ecology, uh, we, allows us to understand things that were impossible to uh, not too long ago, as Scott also mentioned at the beginning. Um, so I, I am using this to work with sustainable agriculture. Um, and I'm very happy that I get to use this very interesting tools for this. Uh, but so remote sensing is a very crucial tool right now for all sorts of earth sciences and the research on the effects and mitigation of climate change. Uh, so much is being invested on very high resolution satellites for, you know, in a world in which there's so much war, um, spy satellites, ultra high res. Um, but um, we really need, and I'm very excited for this, re this release of more hyper, for more hyperspectral satellites and uh, um, more um, large um, wavelength uh, radar so that we can have better estimates of carbon accumulation in forests. Um, so um, this, uh, 
you know, as um, Carl Sagan put very eloquently, I don't think I can do this better than he did. Um, this underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Um, and uh, indeed, a humbling and character building experience, I believe that my fellow astronomy enthusiasts would agree. Here, here. Um, so thank you very much. I hope I didn't take too long. Thank you, Anna. There's a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is um, uh, from Adrian Norwick, and he wants to know about the satellites. He's, he's asking, do the satellite missions process data in space? Or do they just collect and send raw da data down to Earth? So they tend to collect data and send it down to Earth also because um, storage is a, an issue that they have as well, uh, mainly with hyperspectral because there's so much data that they collect with these so many bands. Um, and uh, they try and minimize as much as possible of the, uh, the storage that is done there. So usually um, NASA uh, makes raw data available. And uh, so you can get data as it comes out of the satellite, straight and fresh. Um, but they also process the data and show different steps of processing. For example, for the for Jedi, for the lidar, um, like the ecosystem uh, mission, uh, the the carbon measurements from light from lidar, um, I was using level four processing data. So that means that they've already picked the raw lidar, got canopy height, then they got biomass from it. Um, I see. Okay. Another question is, uh, could radar at microwave frequencies be useful instead of LIDAR or visible light? Um, so usually, the from what I've learned so far is, so I began my research working with just LIDAR, thinking it's the coolest thing ever. It's like Jedi is like new tech. And I quickly learned that combinations of them seem to be the best approach. So even if you have multiple sources of LIDAR, as you combine them and as you compare them, you are more likely to find the most accurate bi uh, biomass estimates. So the tool that I'm using right now is not just radar, it's radar that's been calibrated with LIDAR, hmm. um, which by itself also Jedi has been calibrated with the ground, some ground measured plots and with airborne. So the more the merrier um, and the, each technique can be made better by combination with its cousins. And a final question, are there any missions with actual uh, information of light pollution? Is there a light pollution mission of any kind? Mm. I um, actually, I know that there are, I, 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 I am definitely misinformed about this. I know that there are like, you can find on a lot of NASA's, NASA has a lot of information online, um, mm -hmm. NASA's maps on uh, the, on, on like illumination of the earth by night. We've seen those beautiful photos, right? Sure. Um, so um, I believe that that would probably come from, you know, this is, Pure my own speculation. I believe it'll probably come from multispectral, um, as it is just uh, like you know some sort of like it's, it's just receiving us being emitted by the Earth itself. Um, but I am not sure. I I know that there are missions that work on this. I am that, but I, I believe that it may be the same missions that are doing multispectral during the day. I see. Good question. Uh, it will be interesting to look into it. Right. Okay. Well, Anna, thank you, thank you so much again for coming on and sharing uh, uh, your knowledge. We'll, I'll ask you to come back on again because this is fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, yeah. I actually had a great time, so I'd love to. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thanks. Okay. All right. So our next speaker uh, is none other than Cesar Brolo. Uh, he is uh, down in Argentina, and uh, I think he's going to talk more about the... Uh, uh, the star party that he attended. Is yeah. That right. Yes. Yes, Scott. How are you? Can you hear me? Good. It's all good. <clears throat> Great connection. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Yes. We. I improved the, my connection in my home. <laughs> but maybe for from the balcony. Maybe when we return uh, to to transmit uh, from the the balcony uh, after the star party. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's more. It, I saw that it's more a, a program of the the computer 
that I use in the balcony. But, uh, you know, um, in the rest, in, in, in another parts of the home, we have uh, this connection. Uh, okay. Like, uh, you know, well, I am, uh, I was um, thinking that I, I was not able uh, tonight to share something with the audience because I'm um, not tomorrow, if not tomorrow, tomorrow, in <laughs> two days, I'm going to Catamarca Star Party. You know that I prepare a lot, a lot of things. Um, I'll share with the, with, um, with you uh, and other things more, uh, re returning to the map. Um, well, uh, we are starting to show again the where is Del Rodeo Catamarca. Let me share uh, here and share. Okay. Well, as tonight we was talking about the hair from from the sky, I choose this picture of um, yeah, maps, Google Maps, but not only the map, if not the satellite. The satellite, um, you know, um, picture. Um, let me uh, my education. I put again. Yes, the road. Um, actually, uh, this this one uh, is going to to take by Google Maps, and this is um, we are using the technology that tonight we are talking about satellites, you know. Um, um, well, the calculation for this trip from Buenos Aires to uh, San Fernando del Valle de Catamarca and the location of the Rodeo, it's around 14 hours, 30 minutes. And of course that I'll, I'll, be, not, I'll, be, uh, I'll be going to, to to take a, a stop in this city that is the second city in Argentina in population is Ciudad de Córdoba. You can see that in this area, <clears throat> this is the, the typical agricultural area in Argentina as the same the same kind of, of place where Maxi Live is flat, it's like Texas, but from the center to the west, you start to, to found a um, weather more dry and you start to see small mountains to the highest mountains to the west. <clears throat> Tonight, I don't confuse the west and east because the last week to remember Scott that I, I say I mean, the east and west no 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 go into the west and this is from okay. the to the to the northwest yes and um this is for for because uh, on um, we were we are going to work the, the, the entire near to the entire days we we um close the store and we go to the car and go take, um, we are taking the, the road and to Cordoba with a, with a car full of telescopes and a lot of things. Um, at the second day, I am drive only six hours more by this road. <clears throat> and something that is very interesting it is this area where you, you cross a, a salt lake, very, very big. It's very interesting. And here you, you left the, the flat areas and you start to drive by the mountains. And the area <clears throat> where we go is not the city. In the city is 
the place where we install uh, with Miguel Macaquian. Um, we, I am the one of the the padrinos of of uh, this observatory, and it's a, 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 a huge horror for me. Um, but we make the surf party here in the mountains in this area, very a very very nice area that. Last week, I showed you some pictures from, from, from Google Maps. And this is a, a very nice, very nice place. It's a, a dry weather and you have a, a great conditions, a uh, very gray uh, uh, sky. Uh, at the night, it's, it's a very nice place. Of course, that next time I'll I'll uh, get pictures from taking from uh, from me and all participants. And this is the osteria where we make. Let me osteria rodeo, especially this. This is the the hostel, the the place. Very nice. Very nice, yes. Look that. We uh, we are going to have a, a very nice star party here. It's the first time, and really, we are hoped to, to have a beautiful, a beautiful star party here. This is the locro. That is a typical typical food of Argentina. In in Catamarca, it's a typical more typical food. And well, I don't know if we are going to have a Corona beers, but I don't have any problems with this. <laughs> well, a Milanese. Ah yes, it's, I, <laughs> it's like a hook. Maxi was listening. Yes. <laughs> hey, Maxi, ¿cómo estás? How are you? <laughs> and, yes, ¿cómo anda? Todo bien. And well, um, this is a, a, a very nice place. We are going in two days. We are going uh, to, to this place. Um, the, the weather report is going to have uh, 26 uh, degrees, uh, maybe nine degrees in the in the in the night, that is okay. Is um, at this moment they will report uh, uh, get a clear, clear night. Uh, I have a small presentation. And I share this. Okay. Well, this is that I use this one that I use like as um, you know as um, this the diploma the the certificate of the people that go to the to the star party. Ever we we make a gift with this. Um, some, for example, this year we are going to make a, a gift with a solar a, a Google a, a Eclipse a Googles. And uh, you know um, we are watching something of the, of the eclipse. Something fun is well. First of all, this is the program. The chronograma we start at the fourteen in in the uh, two two uh, two p.m. Uh, with accreditations. Uh, the first talk is at a. Uh, all this is is before the the lunch, uh, fourteen to two p.m. accreditations. Uh, how many movements have the axis of the um, of axis rotation of of uh, terrestrial or well? I I prepare a, a translate translation for for this next time. Uh, but how many how many rotation axes have the the hair? It's not only one. Um, only of rotation, not translation. You know, uh, this, it, it will be very interesting. This is an astronomer, Doctora Maria Silvina de Viasi. Um, 
at 4 p.m. Oh my God, uh, astronomy amateur, visual or photographica. Uh, amateur astronomy, visual of or uh, astrophotography. I'll talk about this uh, together with the ingeniero Alejandro Varelli, my friends, that we was talking with the, 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 the people from many, many years. Um, uh, Alejandro Varelli uh, have an excellent work over, you know, the, um, he's a, a big fan of your eyepieces, of Explore Scientific Eyepieces. And he worked with many, many brands. He have a collection of 80, uh, 80 eyepieces in in their in their uh, boxes uh, and he worked a lot uh, making all for for the people uh, about calculations for you know for uh, uh, extraction pupil a lot of things a lot of things for each eyepiece well we have it at uh, 5 5 a, a pm coffee break uh, well, we are going to have a lot of things uh, different uh, at the night. Uh, we are going, of course, to watch the sky. Saturday, ah, this is very interesting. Well, this is the program that it's for the three days. We finish with a round table, origin, origin and evolution of the universe by Dr. Gabriel Bengochea. Gabriel Bengochea is a, is a great physics. Um, it's very, very interesting because he is actually uh, an investigation for, for a lot of things that image that came from, from the web, from the web telescope. Um, tension sobre la determinación, tension. Well, I, I can't, uh, sorry that I can't, uh, uh, um, you know, I can't uh, translate properly this. Uh, tension over the determination of the, well, expansion of the universe, but okay. Next time I I prepare a, a small resume of this. Um, now we are going to the very important thing: the menu for the three days, Scott. Hmm. And I could I could uh, translate this. What do you think? Bacon, batambre, empanadas. What do you think, Maxi? If you are if you are uh, yes. listening. <laughs> Next time, the entry, Maxi, the entry of course, and the astronomy of astronomy. Yes, gastronomy. Yes, gastronomy. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, this is very important for every day. Uh, um, it's very important that we have it all day in trance of uh, baked matambre empanadas. It's very important. Well, the Saturday 14, jamón y queso, ham and cheese omelette. And uh, okay, I'll. I think that I'll uh, return with maybe five kilos more. And this is a picture of, of the Salt Lake, Salinas Grandes, uh, going from Córdoba to Catamarca and cruising a part of Santiago del Estero. It's a huge, huge Salinas. It's very, very interesting. Um, another thing that I made, I don't know if I have time, Scott, only one minute more, maybe. I okay. show, I can, I can show you, yes, no, no, but I, 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 I don't see my time. Okay. Uh, short thing of this, I'll show you the things that I prepared uh, today. For example, uh, solar filters, because we are going to watch a uh, small part of the eclipse in a partial part of the eclipse and i'll share you some pictures only you can see this i prepare mm -hmm. solar filter for oh. for a, a different telescope that the people told me ah, okay I, I need some solar solar filter or uh, um this one it was prepared for the 11 inches uh, 11, 11 inches schmidt cassegrain um, I confess that I use a ring of a like of a like um, leather like uh, that is out of use that it was uh, uh, without use, 
and they are excellent, excellent. The ring, because it's a structural metal structure, um, uh, work properly, work it properly to to assembly a solar a solar a solar film. I use the polymer polymero CR um, thirty nine. Uh, but it's very strong, but of, you, you know that uh, it's the same of, of the solar uh, shades. Um, well, I, we prepare all in our laboratory. It's, it's really here, you can see, you can see oh, yeah. the film, and we prepare the film. Mm -hmm. Here is, is ready. We I put a, a, a double double stick um, tape. Um, the best way is put very clean. You, you know, the best way that we we uh, choose is is put the ring over the film. Um, this was work really really good. Um, you don't care. If you have a, a, some a, some not scratches but but a, a, a some waves, it's not a problem because you know that the film work properly, and you don't need to put something so flat or you know. But of course, that that uh, the best way is make a, a good work. Here is me working all day, uh, uh, assembly fil solar filters for the star party. Because um, we are using a lot of different telescope. We are carrying a lot of telescope to the star party. And we need solar filter to, to see the partial eclipse for, for the, the participants, you know. A very very careful work. Yes, <laughs> you know, and clean, and and really was was a nice a nice work. And this is the the finished work. We use duct tape to cover all, um, and really really uh, we don't use never never we don't use glue uh, because it's not safe. We use um, a, a, a a good uh, a good brand. Of um, of um, filter material. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, I, I, I would run uh, of for for this the tape double side tape. You know, and uh, this is much better than the glue to 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 um, to assembly for assembly uh, solar filter for telescopes. Um, the last thing that I show you. Only one minute is this is how many how many cover the, the moon from Catabarca, no Buenos Aires is, is, is a little more. This is all that we are watching this Saturday. Ah. We are not going to to this is all. <laughs> uh, for, for us, it's enough. Something that was crazy that was when we started to organize, uh, we forget the, the clips. Um, for us, it was a, pri uh, uh, a surprise, a surprising prize that, come on, this, this Saturday we have the clips. It um, was a plus, was a plus, or oh, it's a plus that we don't uh, we don't expect because they say okay we have an eclipse inside the star party of course it's, it's like a like a small piece of of uh, it's it's like a, something you know um like a, a dent in 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 a in a piece in a, in a, in a pea in a pea in a in, in a torta well <laughs> i'm sorry with my english so, mm -hmm. well well, I I return next uh, Thursday with with a, a lot of pictures. I'm hope that that with a lot of things to show to the audience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, 
Well, we, I, I'll go in. I have in my, in my, our warehouse, we are preparing everything, the promotion material, the telescope that we carry, everything, everything. Um, yeah, and, you know. and uh, uh, Cesar, you will be giving how many talks during this program? Sorry, w will you give presentations yourself at uh, at the star party? How, how many how many presentations For, I yeah. have here in Global Star Party? No, no, Over, no, no. Ah, no, the sorry. Star Party you're going to tomorrow. Ah, uh, yes. Will you give a presentation there? Yes, of course. Of about about optics. I see. About, okay. about optics, yes, yes. Two presentations about optics and about care uh, connected with the, with the idea of health in, in our um, uh, vision for, mm -hmm. for our eyes. Uh, I'll, I'll go into talk a little about protection for our eyes when we watch a, a solar eclipse. The eclipse, yeah. Yes, yes. Great yes. idea. So. Yes, yes, yes. I have two talks in. I have two talks in this year. Yes, they. they I, I, ha I, I care. have a question for you, Caesar. You, you are your um, facility uh, analyzes people's eyes and fits them for glasses. Have you met anyone that had damage from looking at the sun? Yes. But a very old man, a very old amateur astronomer, uh -huh. was very interesting. For maybe, maybe I remember that he told me that was a, a eclipse from from the. He, first of all, he ha, he had maybe ninety five in the in the ninety years, and uh, was a. Uh, he came from maculopathy, uh, that is a problem of, of in, in the retina, but normal for Asian people. But he told me when he watched a um, telescope in our tent, I was working with him uh, like an optometrist, you know, but um, he, this guy told me that he had a small, small black area mm. from their their uh, young years because it was an eclipse maybe in the 1940s in Argentina. Oh. My father know him. And this guy had a, a small, small uh, black area or blind area in his retina um because he watched uh, an eclipse um with no filter obviously no and maybe 1940s it was in the 40s you know maybe yeah. he used something like a, a glass with a smoke oh, you know smoke, that like the soot the yes, yes yes uh, yes and, yeah. Don't and that. but i never i never saw an, in a modern uh, yes <laughs> and it, it, it will be very interesting because normally we receive the people in low vision. Low vision is sure. a problem of macula. Um, but I remember that this guy was a very, very interested guy, um, old man, but, you know, an um, amateur astronomer. I he told me, oh, I have my mark, <laughs> like a, something pro, <laughs> you wow. know, the, 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 the old generations, uh, they are sometimes are lovely people. And was the first, the first thing that I I listen about this guy that mm -hmm. he really he had their first bleeding spot in in in, Blind spot. Their, in yeah. his retina, mm -hmm. yes, in one eyes of course, and was incredible, incredible. Yeah, so be careful, you know, make sure that you're using solar filters correctly. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, I, in 2017, I remember that we had a customer, he was an amateur astronomer, I, and I've told this story before, but it, I tell it again and again, especially around the time of an eclipse. Um, he asked us if he could buy eclipse glasses and then look through his telescope. 
Okay. No, he my vote. Have to buy a, a, a filter for his telescope, just for his eyes. And uh, yes, I made a video yes. and you can see that the sunlight coming through the eyepiece just instantly burns. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So I, I, remember, I remember that that uh, today it's the, the, the connection between the uh, uh, manufacturers uh, yeah. for telescopes and the people is another thing. You, me, and many, many people watch uh, in, the, in the end of the 80s that many, many times we received telescopes uh, from Japan or the first one from China Just with the, the, with the uh, solar filter it for for a screw screw in the in the eyepiece Into and this is eyepiece. crazy i remember that i needed all times uh open the box and, and take the take this and yes go to the trash never never it's yes yeah. um that you, because it, they're it's hard to even see something like that today because um yes the countries they, 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 they actually made that illegal you know uh, absolutely do, and but, maybe uh, the connection between, you know, between the, the manufacturers, the dealer, um, is different, the, the information of the people. But despite this, uh, take the all, all things, for example, today, making the, the, the solar filters, <clears throat> I put uh, two different layers of tape and, and a special, a special material to keep very, very safe in this the, in their own place the yeah. the material and it's something that i make from many many years and i we use we bought in united states a cr39 polymer in military gray that is very very different to the to the thing simple it, it's the same that that explore scientific use and because it's, it's the best sure the best uh, the best material to use because it's safe, it's not easy to broke or scratch. Because if you found some scratch in the in the aluminum layer of, of your filter, don't use please. Yeah, yeah. Because you know yeah. the aluminum is a filter too. And um well, but I think that the audience, this audience is take a, a lot of uh, different cares about but uh, but i think in the people that in the common people sometimes from the tv national tv and very popular culture don't receive the the the, the real things about the care uh for watch an eclipse right yeah thank you very much it's, Scott. it's, it's better now uh, one last question uh um, yes uh, MG Astronomy is watching on YouTube, and he says, I remember some people using x-ray sheets, you know, like for x-ray when it was uh, shot on film. And uh, he wanted to know if this was the case in Argentina around the late 60s or early 70s. Did they use film like... Um, the x-ray films, yeah, for like, example, like I remember... Like exposed film that was uh, all black, you know? Yes, um, of course. That 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 I think that be, uh, before this time, all before this time in the eighties or earlier. Today we have manufacturers of of, of films with the ISO, the ISO properties, and and, and take a, a really a lot of different uh, uh, complements for safety and um, maybe from the 80s um, and backward uh, maybe it's like you tell me it's called uh, x-ray uh, films or um, you know I, I don't know but how many how many different things I know that the people use the most the more the, mo the safest thing in the past ever ever was the number 14 um, welder welder uh, glass yeah. Yeah. i don't know if welder glass but uh, scott uh, tell me that this is it's a right number in english the, for welding i i don't you know i i don't recommend welding glass so, no 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 you know, no i so I, I, I was talking in the past in the, the past the, i i know yes, yes. no 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 you know 
Uh, sorry if I uh, introduce, uh, but I remember when the, the 2nd of July of 2090, uh, Sun Eclipse in Argentina, uh, I was in the farm area in Gorostiaga, and I remember the, the little kids from that farm, they got sunglasses that the school gave them to watch the Sun Eclipse. And uh, they remember that they could not take over uh, in the moment of the the, the 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 sun comes up again. They could see without the, the sunglasses the, the, the total eclipse, but uh, they have to be prepared to put it on again to watch the the sun comes uh, shining again. So I remember that there was a darker uh, afternoon and when that uh, the sun came up again it was wow it was shocking but these kids they were prepared because some people say you can you need to do this for pre precaution and um, but i remember in 2017 when i saw the first one a, a solar eclipse i didn't have solar filter i only have a, a refractor telescope and of course i knew that it's impossible to watch the the the, the solar eclipse through the telescope without a filter but i did it in the um projection pro, uh, by projection to yes. a paper put it yes. on a carton tape that is and in a darker area, I project the... Totally, the, Maxi, yes, mm -hmm. the, the projection. Uh, I remember that in the 90s, the, the, that where we have a totality by Misiones in the north of Argentina, the, the, the same eclipse, I, I couldn't go to Misiones. And I remember that we prepared in, the, in another store a, a, a solar projection, a very big one meter of, of diameter of, of the, in the screen, with a small refractor, uh, with a barlow, you know, and an and, and eyepiece. Um, it's safe because if something can be um, uh, betrayed, not betrayed, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, arruinado, or is the telescope, Rain it. but Rain not Rain it. Uh, uh, damage, damage. Damage. Yes. Can be damaged the telescope, no the eyes. And this is, I think that, if you if you are not are not sure of of your of the your instrument, I think for especially for this kind of, of partial eclipses, uh, a projection a projection can be safe if you don't have nothing. But it's not so safe because the problem is with the kids that sometimes the kids like to see something or or when are pointing to the to the sun is very bad idea the projection because you sometimes the people are watching <laughs> a lot of, of light that they 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 receive is is really dangerous filter the best way is filter <laughs> exactly yes well thank you okay it's, it's, thank you very it's, much it's your sure. turn maxi <laughs> yeah. and we'll turn it over to you maxi thank you so much for coming uh, on to the global star party <laughs> well Thank you guys for inviting me. Uh, well, I, sorry if I interrupt the discussion. And Cesar, have a really good no, night. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Have a really good night this weekend in Catamarca. I hope you enjoy the, the your star party. So, well, uh, what I'm going to show you is going uh, what I'm be doing this couple of days. You can see I'm feeling much, much more better, but I'm still <laughs> coughing. Sorry. But I'm feeling much better. You feel better. Anyway, okay. yeah, <laughs> that's important. Um, what I want to show you is some things that I've been doing. Um, okay, do you see in my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, of course, in this case, it's a total solar eclipse. And in this case, it's not going to happen from here. Even in the northern hemisphere, is not because it's going to be an annular eclipse. So the moon, it's much uh, farther now, so, and not cover completely the 
the solar disk. So it's going to be impossible. But anyway, in Argentina, in my place, it's going to be like this at almost uh, 5 p.m. Uh, on the afternoon. It's going to be like this. But this weekend, I'm going I will not going to be in my in here, so I'm going to move more to the south because uh, we're going to do some landscape with some friends, including uh, Nico, and we're going to be here in Sierra de la Ventana. Uh, this is our our little mountains in the Buenos Aires province, and unfortunately here in this place. Uh, let me put it the 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 location is in uh, just here. a bit. Now it's um, it's nothing. Uh, no, Torki, seguramente. Tor no, wow. And it's going to be like this almost from here. So you can see this almost nothing at that time of the solar eclipse. So anyway, uh, it's going to be impossible to watch it from this region. And um, well, what I'm going to show you is like I say, I was doing this couple of days ago. I was uh, taking pictures to the uh, Elix Nebula, uh, the eye of God that everyone called it. And in this case, you can see uh, we have three images of this place, but these are very different because in this one was only a, a, a one night stack image. And this was two night stack image. <laughs> And this one was three nights of stacking imaging. So basically in the this part, there's a lot of difference and a, it's more brighting than here, than the second one. And of course the, 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 the first. So when I process this, um, I was, I think, Two days processing this. I, I was I was not bothered to watch it, but my eyes, they uh, always uh, when I see something, uh, uh, every time and every time, you lost per uh, per uh, uh, focus on what you got to do. So my final image from this of the processing and everything was this one and you can see there's a lot of details in the core of the uh, this big, huge planetary nebula and i saw a picture of a uh, i think it was the esa telescope and of course <laughs> there's a lot of differences but uh, anyway I really love to capture all these little uh, shapes and the uh, colors of this particular nebula. Uh, but anyway, I I still think that I'm still capturing a couple of nights much later. But uh, anyway, there is a really good one object to to. Uh, immortality. So the bonus uh, object that I uh, also captured for that third night was this region. And this particular region is wow. uh, in the large Mag Magagenia cloud. So Beautiful. basically here uh, is now uh, rising up from the southeast to the uh, to the Senate and then to the southwest. So I will have it 
all night long for a couple of months. So I will have to, uh, if I get this from one single night, I can't even imagine if I will get four nights taking uh, pictures of this place. So there's a lot of objects that they are in this area. And it, th these are near from the uh, Tarantula Nebula, but it's more outside of the large Magellanic cloud. And I process this image <laughs> uh, and I get this result for the night, but I didn't like the process finish. But anyway, I had to get more de uh, data. And I annotate this uh, object. Oh, sorry, this was this one. And you can see there's here's the the different NGC objects that we have. You can you can see NGC 2020, 2040, uh, 2030, 2032, NGC 20. Uh, there's a lot. Many. Mm -hmm. in a single field of view. And of course, there are a lot of global clusters. And I think this is a little galaxy, you know, if you can see here, there are, but the, the catalog, it, it doesn't appear. I don't know if I do uh, a P PGC catalog or something, but it's kind of galaxy, but the, and of course, there's a lot of nebulosities, uh, really small. But of course, this one, but the, the catalog doesn't uh, put it on it. Um, but anyway, this I, I saw pictures of this field of view only, and they are incredible. But anyway, it's good to have all this one too in the single picture and you know i hope to to continue to capture this one because it's very rich of oxygen 3 and h alpha and you can see on this particular colors and the 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 core of this nebulosity is um, amazing i really wanted to capture a lot a long mm -hmm. time ago i did this only in rgb but it doesn't the same data and the colors, of course, uh, they're they are not the same. So I will, I will, I will have my, my goal for this season of the large Mediterranean cloud, I think. So, well, uh, I think this is for all tonight. I hope that you enjoyed my Thank presentation. Uh, well, uh, let's see you maybe if I still alive, uh, the next GSP. So you're getting yeah. better and better all the time, so I think you'll you'll, you'll be fine. No, but for for my health and my breathing, it's okay, you know. But for my landscape from this large weekend that we I have, yeah. we're going to do a trip of walking through mountains of fifty kilometers. Maybe we're oh, going wow. to rest on the top of this uh, mountain. Okay, uh, that's it. It's called the, the, the top of the Buenos Aires province because it's the, it's the point of more high altitude, almost, I think, 1,239 meters above the, 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 the sea. Mm -hmm. So it's really high. Uh, the weather says it's going to be uh, with maybe 20 celsius degrees and night 70 uh, sorry at night uh, uh, seven mm -hmm. but i think at that high it's going to be much more low so <laughs> i will tell you scott <laughs> i'll okay. send you some pictures from that <laughs> all right take your vitamins <laughs> <laughs> yeah you'll be stronger well, better everything for doing this so that's well, i i have my my mountain bag now so i had to put oh, like everything backpack uh, right okay exactly yeah. <laughs> okay well, wonderful
Th I think camping thank is, you guys. Uh, is great for, for anyone. So thank you so much, mm -hmm. Maxie. Hope to see you next no, uh, Global Star Party. Take care. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Okay, folks, uh, we are going to take a 10 minute break and we will be back with Caitlin Goulet. Um, or Goulet, maybe this is how it's actually pronounced. I, she is new to uh, the Global Star Party, um, and uh, she's a remarkable young lady, uh, and I'm very excited to have her on. So hang in there, get, uh, get a cup of coffee, grab a sandwich, relax a little bit, stretch your legs, and we'll be back with more Global Star Party.
Um, Scott, I'm sorry, can you hear me? I think you're muted. Hi, everyone, I'm muted. <laughs> I appreciate that, Caitlin. Um, anyways, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Caitlin Goulet. It's Goulet, correct? Yes, it is. Great, okay, all right. Um, and uh, uh, I did want to say that, uh, you know, I, I was really excited about all the stuff that we're learning today about our own precious planet Earth. Um, Caitlin uh, was introduced to me by David Eicher from Astronomy Magazine, where he saw her give a talk at Stella Fane. And um, I think she was giving a, uh, uh, a, a planet, uh, a planet by planet uh, description, uh, kind of like a scale model, model of the solar system or something. But yep. caitlin has been doing this for quite a while. She gets introduced to uh, a local science center at age five, uh, and apparently she goes there quite often. Uh, and by age seven, she's now involved with the local astronomy club. She gets involved at, at that young age. She starts doing serious double star observations, uh, which is um, uh, fantastic uh, at such a young age. Um, and as she grows older uh, and, is, you know, we're all under lockdown from the uh, global pandemic, which is the reason that we start a global star party, uh, she starts something called the Starry Scoop. And uh, this was a monthly newsletter uh, where she was disseminating the news of astronomy. Uh, and that newsletter now goes all over the world. Uh, Caitlin, I'm going to bring you on uh, to uh, give your presentation, but certainly uh, please tell them about Starry Scoop and where they can subscribe to it themselves. Yes, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Hi, all. My name's Caitlin. Um, I will mention the Starry Scoop later on tonight, and it'll show up in my little presentation here. Um, but for tonight, I'm going to tell my story and my astronomy journey. So how I got into it um, and what's my life been like since. Um, again, I got into astronomy from a very young age at about five years old. Um, in the months leading up to my first year at school, kindergarten, um, my mom would bring me to the Springfield Science Museum's planetarium almost every single day. Um, my sisters and I would lay back in the chairs and just look up. And we would not only be cap captivated by the stars um, dotting the ceiling, but by the planetarium educators' stories. So that's really what got us um, initially um, just our start in astronomy. We then learned about the Springfield um, Science Museum's outreach event. Um, it was monthly called Stars Over Springfield, and we attended that. And then we became part of the Springfield Stars Club which is an amateur astronomy club in that same town. So here's a few photos of me. Um, I was a little here. This is me observing the sun, the moon. And I mean, this community was just very welcoming. I, it, it was fun. So when I got my first telescope when I was seven years old, um, little did I know that I would be featured in the Springfield Stars Club's monthly newsletter. Um, this is my telescope's first light. You can see here, um, it was winter, it was a bit cold. I'm up in New England. Um, I mean, I was just very excited. My dad and um, the writer planned this. Um, he showed it to me the next day and I was just astonished. Mm. So of course we had a branch out. We joined the Amherst Astronomy Club as well as the Arona Hill Na Nature and Science Center. Um, these are two um, amazing clubs. Sadly, the Amherst Club disbanded, but the Arena Hill Club is just amazing. It's part of a dark sky site up in Cummington, Massachusetts. We go um, camping up there. We bring our telescopes. We go on nature walks. We launch rockets. It's a lot of fun. So, of course, I had to go to the annual event up in Northfield, the Astronomers Conjunction. Um, again, this was just a great event. Um, a lot of welcoming people in astronomy just got together, and I learned a lot from it. And then I went to the Harvard's, Harvard Center of, for Astrophysics, and I visited their glass plate collection, which was very, very interesting. 
We then went up to Anna Marie College at the Aldrich um, Astronomical Society. And of course, I attended Stella Fane. Um, Scott mentioned Stella Fane. This is um, an annual astronomy convention up in Springfield, Vermont. Uh, and I started going to this in about 2015, 2016, and I haven't missed one since, except of course for the pandemic year, but we don't really count that. Um, this is me on a little rock standing um, atop Breezy Hill. So of course that was all my personal life and how I pursued my astronomy interest, but I wanted to bring that to my school life. So in second grade, second grade me put together three big projects that year. Um, I did um, a little poster on Uranus, my favorite planet at the time. I was just so interested in it, um, its rings, its tilt, how it came to be. So that's me standing next to my project. I gave a PowerPoint presentation to my class just to share um, what astronomy was, what you can do to get involved. And then at the end of the year, I dressed up as Katie Coleman, um, an astronaut from around my area, and pretended to be here for a day. And for me, this was very important because I met her previous, um, previously before this little presentation that I gave. But um, after that, in the years following, I met her several times, and now um, I can say that I really know her as a friend. So that was elementary school. And then when I got to sixth grade, I really wanted to branch out more and get all my friends involved in um, space and astronomy. So I worked with my teachers and I convinced them to set up a star party in our field one night. Um, this was my telescope. And from the star party, I decided to start an astronomy club. And it was going great. We had a lot of interest, a lot of club members, but sadly, the pandemic put it to a halt. Um, and this is something that we were not expecting. We didn't know how we could get together and observe safely because at that time we didn't know like how dangerous COVID was. So I decided to take matters into my own hands and I needed to communicate um, with the club and keep them all together. So I decided to start the Starry Scoop. Um, like Scott mentioned, this is a monthly space and astronomy newsletter. I've been writing it since April of 2020. I haven't missed a month since. Um, and I've put out special editions of it. Um, I've really enjoyed writing this. Um, it's a great way to keep the community involved. And since then, it's just really exploded. Um, it goes out worldwide. Um, if you guys would like to receive um, copies of your own, you can contact me at starryscoop at gmail.com or visit me on Facebook. I have a Facebook page that is just Starry Scoop. Excellent. So because we are stuck at home, um, we used a lot of Zoom, and so the Springfield Science Museum invited me on their online outreach program called AstroQuest Online, and we had a ton of fun. It, it was kind of like this event that we have here, um, but sadly, it has been put on halt since, but it was a lot of fun. I learned how to really public speak here. Um, it was a great way to reach the community while we were all stuck at home. Um, just following that I became a board member of the Springfield Stars Club. This was a very important time for me because um, I was just a member of this club for many, many years since I was just five years old. Um, and being a board member just really meant a lot for me. Um, and at this time, I was giving presentations for them, um, not only to um, club members at their club meetings, but at outreach events um, where we help out. And it was just a really fun time, a great way to get the community involved again. So that was my elementary school days. And then I shifted gears into middle school. The pandemic restrictions finally lifted and we were able to meet in person. So I wanted to start up another space and astronomy club. So I got the old gang back together. And this is us at our kickoff star party or observing event um, out in the middle school parking lot. You can see my telescope again here. I think this night we're looking at Jupiter, Saturn, the moon, and I think the Orion Nebula, which is very, very fun. Now, this club was just amazing. We had a ton of members involved. We did outreach at Walmart one night. We observed the moon because, again, light pollution kind of put a halt to everything else. But the moon was just stunning, um, and club members had a lot of fun. 
And then we are surprised by one of our fellow students' grandfather um, donating a telescope that he made um, decades ago to the club. Now, this telescope was beautifully handcrafted, and we decided to kind of spruce it up a bit so it's ready for, for use. So we Googled online how to clean it. I've never, I never did this before. Um, so it was kind of um, very nerve wracking, but we did it. We took it apart. We cleaned the mirror and we put it back together. Um, and we still have this to this day. Um, we use it for a different observing events. And then um, after our efforts of bringing astronomy to the public kind of got out in our town, our local gas and electric company decided to give us a grant for $500 to purchase a modified library telescope. Um, and we put this in our elementary school where we all came from um, to kind of give back to younger astronomers. And to this day, they still have an astronomy club in that elementary school, which is really, really cool. And they still use this scope. So that was middle school. And I'm ha happy to say I moved to high school. I graduated um, and I'm now in 10th grade. So in these two years, this club has done a lot. Um, I think on the second day of school, I got a call from our local gas and electric company and they wanted to feature us on a uh, powerful stories um, kind of news segment. So they interviewed us in the new high school and it was just so much fun. We were able to reach the community again, get everyone involved. And we kind of brought back old club, or club members to restart this club in high school. Excellent. Um, and then again, to kick off the club, we were invited by again, the gas and electric company to have a booth at our town's annual pumpkin festival. Um, it was a fall festival attended by I think 5,000 to 8,000 people um, each year. So it was huge. Um, we were able to borrow a 90 millimeter core Coronado dedicated solar telescope, which had a built-in hydrogen alpha filter, which was amazing. Um, and I mean, hundreds and thousands of people visited our booth that day, and it was just great to see the community involved. Um, coincidentally, this event is actually happening again this weekend, the day of the annual, ecl annual eclipse, and I am crossing my fingers that our bad weather holds off or at least gets pushed to Sunday so we can see this because we have a perfect opportunity to bring per, like beautiful views of this eclipse to the public. And then I think a few weeks following that, we were invited to Six Flags New England um, where we set up a few solar telescopes and had a few different interactive activities for the kids. And we were able to get the public involved yet again um, and it was just fun. It was a fun way to um, bring outreach to the community. And then this was recently, we borrowed again, the Coronado telescope and we brought it to our town green. Um, and I mean, we had dozens and dozens of people attend. Um, it was a great way to get the community involved again. This is me with the telescope. And then this is going back a bit. This was November of 2022. We got the club together to view the total lunar eclipse. This was very, very fun. Um, these are some photos I took um, in the phases leading up to it and the totality. Um, this is kind of an example of getting the community involved again. We invited the public to come and just a bunch of club members came and they were educated on this event. They got to view it. And I mean, some of these kids were really, really dedicated. They were able to wake up at 3 4 a.m and drag their parents out of bed to get them to drive to this event so it was very very fun so this was uh pretty recently this is january 6th 6th 2023 we gave a talk at stars over springfield um and may i remind you that this was the very event that kind of got me into astronomy this was the outreach event thrown by the springfield science museum that I went to when I was just a mere five years old. Mm. Um, so our club talked here and we're actually giving another talk in a few months in January again. And I mean, these club members, fabulous presentations, fabulous stories. It was just a lot of fun. So even more recently, we went to Springfield Symphony Hall and we had a little booth there. We went as a club. 
Um, we brought and shared our love of astronomy with the public. This is our little booth. Um, this is another telescope that we purchased for the schools. And clear skies, but before I end off here, I just want to remind you all that we are all citizens of our planet Earth. And when you go outside and under the starry night we and look up, just remind yourself that we are all looking at the same sky. Thank you. Wow, that was excellent, excellent. Um, uh, Caitlin, uh, thank you for, uh, uh, you know, talking about Starry Scoop. Uh, it really is near and dear to my heart uh, that you did this during the pandemic. Um, uh, of course, uh, when the everybody went to lockdown, I can't tell you how many phone calls and emails and text messages I got from people that were just kind of going out of their minds that, you know, they couldn't go to star parties, they couldn't attend astronomy meetings and stuff like that. So I think that what you did was very, very important. Um, I also want to add too, I think that uh, all the educational outreach work that you've done is very important. I, I want to ask you, have you already seen it take some effect? Have you seen um, young people change because of your uh, work with um, you know, showing them the stars, maybe seeing Saturn for the first time or something like that? Oh, definitely. Um, earlier this week, I went back to my middle school mm -hmm. and I represented the middle school club because, I mean, it's still ongoing. And I had a telescope set out um, outside to look at Saturn. And those kids were just so amazed by Saturn that, I mean, they a lot of them just called their parents over and said, Mom, Dad, you got to come look at Saturn. This is amazing. And the parents would look at it and they'd ask me, hey, did you put an image in there? Like, what are we seeing? Oh, yeah, like a little slide or something. That... Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I can see the effects that just v viewing Saturn has on these people. And I mean, I've, I've seen through so many events, looking at the sun, the moon, the um, eclipses, it, it just the impact is huge. And I'm just so happy that I had I have this opportunity to bring this to them. Yeah, well, I think it's fantastic. I don't think you're going to stop doing it. I, I, I get the sense that this is kind of a already a life mission for you. Um, where do you see yourself going? And I mean, you're in high school now. What, what's next? I would love to go into astrophysics. Um, I haven't picked out a college yet. I have my parents harping on me that, for that. But okay. I, I mean, I love science. I love astronomy. I'd love to pursue a field in that. And of course, I'd love to public speak even more and just do more outreach and bring it to the public. Fantastic. Well, you're always welcome here on Global Star Party. So that's that's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. David Levy, uh, you're still here with us. What did you think? You are you are muted like I was. <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> So, is this better? That's better. Is this better? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I wanted. I just wanted to say that I was so impressed with Caitlin's presentation, her uh, delivery, the poise, the uh, emotion, and everything that she had in it. It kind of reminded me of how I got started mm. a little bit, and seeing how I got started through her eyes was really very, very special. Congratulations, Caitlin. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, Caitlin, thanks, thanks again. And um, again, uh, you know, you're welcome uh, as a, you can consider yourself a permanent VIP on Global Star Party, so take care. Okay, so let's, um, let's transition here. Um, we will uh, go to uh, Mike Wiesner, who is in very near um, uh, David Levy up there in uh, Arizona. And so uh, Mike uh, is uh, heading to Indiana, and um, uh, you are going to uh, attend, or you're getting things ready for a so uh, solar eclipse festival. Is that right? Mm, that's right. Yeah, for next April. Wonderful. Okay. Well, you've got the stage, Michael. 
Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, great to be back on Global Star Party. It's been a while since I've been on, about a year, I guess, uh, when we had the big star party up here in Oracle, the David H. Levy Arizona Dark Sky Star Party, uh, September of last year. Looking forward to having another one back up here. Uh, that was a great event. The community really loved it. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about something here the, that's coming up for next April. Uh, let me get my screen sharing going here. Uh, if this works, let's see, it should do it, hopefully. So I hope you can all see my screen now. Yep. And I hope my internet connection stays reasonable. So um, we're going to talk about this total solar eclipse festival. It's going to be going on in Seymour, Indiana, uh, next April. So many of you are probably wondering where Seymour is, what is it? In fact, some of you may be even wondering, what is Indiana? Where is Indiana in the United States? <laughs> so uh, we're gonna talk about that. But first of all, let's get into a little bit of history of Seymour. Uh, it's been around for a number of years as a community. It was first settled in the early 1800s by James Shields and his family. Uh, there's lots of things around the town that are now you know, honoring that name. Uh, he got a North-South Railroad established in the late 1840s. And then shortly after that, in the mid-1850s, he got an East-West Railroad that's coming through his area. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of the growth spurt uh, for Seymour. The town was named for the railroad civil engineer, J. Seymour. Town was incorporated in 1864 with a population of 1,553. Freeman Army Airfield was an advanced pilot training base during World War II. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting little thing to me as a uh, former Air Force pilot. Interesting little tidbit about this uh, airfield. They had a, a captured V-2 rocket there. They didn't launch it. It was just studied. They had a lot of captured German Air, uh, Air Force uh, planes there at the base. Uh, so they did a lot of really cool stuff there at this old Army airfield back in World War II time frame. Today's population is about 22,000, which is a pretty good increase from what it was when I was growing up in Seymour back in the 1950s and 1960s. The population was about 12,000 back then. Now, Seymour has some claims to fame, and we'll just highlight a few of those. First train robbery in the United States occurred in Seymour area in October 6, 1866, by the Reno brothers. They stole about twelve dollars to $15,000 worth of uh, stuff. Uh, so that was the first train robbery in the United States, my hometown. It's known as the crossroads of America because of those two intersecting uh, east, west, north, south uh, railroads going through Seymour, creating a lot of business, a lot of traffic through the area. There's also two major north, south, and east, west cross-country highways passing through Seymour. So it really is the crossroads of not only southern Indiana, but of America. It's also been the home for a few famous people. Edgar Wickham, governor of Indiana in 1969 to 1973, was in his hometown, but he lived there for a number of years. And when I would be walking to uh, a couple of the schools that I attended there in Seymour back in the 50s and 60s, I walked past uh, where his home was. Big home. Katie Stam was Miss America in 2008 and Miss America, Miss Indiana in 2008 and Miss America in 2009. Uh, so that was kind of a, a big deal for the community. John Mellencamp, famous uh, rock and roll musician, he likes to say he was born in a small town of Seymour, Indiana, and he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, back in 2008. So there's this nice mural uh, there in the community about him. A little bit of an astronomy twist now. Dr. Frank Evanson said Seymour is his hometown, and he was the Indiana University Astronomy Department chairman from 1944 to 1978, long run for a department chairman. He began his research career in 1934, working at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, as an observing assistant to Clyde Tombaugh, the discoverer of Pluto. 
And I refer you to David Levy's excellent biography of Clyde Tombaugh. Uh, he touches on this relationship between Indiana University and at that time, I believe he was a graduate student, uh, Frank Edmondson, and the, the work that he did there at Lowell Observatory uh, with Clyde. So rather interesting connections uh, personally here to me, being from Seymour and now living here in Arizona. Rather interesting. A little bit more about Dr. Edmondson. He established the IU Asteroid Program in 1949. I worked on the Asteroid Program as an undergraduate student at Indiana University uh, from 1966 through 1970. Uh, I was part-time during my four years of college, and then after I graduated in 1970, I worked on the program full-time uh, for a couple of months. Dr. Edmondson was the Astronomy Program's director 1956-57 for the National Science Foundation. He was an advisor on the development and site selection of the National Optical Astronomy Observatories, now known as NORLAB. And so he was involved, heavily involved with uh, the selection and creation of Kitt Peak National Observatory out here just uh, 65 miles to me in that direction. He was instrumental in creating the Association of the Universities for Research in Astronomy. So he's pretty well connected uh, back in those days in, in uh, astronomy. There was another kind of maybe famous hometown boy. Um, that's me with uh, my three inch Newtonian telescope from Edmund Scientific. And that was taken on Easter Sunday morning in 1962. I made the front page of the local uh, newspaper in December 1964 with some photos of a lunar, total lunar eclipse that I had taken uh, using that telescope and a little uh, roll camera, box camera that my mom had that I modified. And I saw my first solar eclipse in the front yard of my home there in Seymour in July of 1963. And there's that same three inch telescope uh, with a projection screen mounted above the eyepiece projecting the eclipsed sun image there. So very briefly, we're gonna talk about the solar eclipse next April. Uh, this is the path of totality coming through Indiana. And down here is where Seymour is. And it was really an interesting decision I had to make because I know Bloomington, Indiana University over here is going to be having a big event going on. Did I want to go to my alma mater or do I want to go to my hometown? Well, hometown came through and invited me first. So that's where I'm going to be. So the eclipse starts at 1.15 in the afternoon. Totality starts at 3.06. Totality ends at 3.09. Eclipse will end at 4.23. So Seymour is going to have a respectable uh, totality duration of three minutes and seven seconds. That's kind of cool. So being on the path of totality, Seymour is going to have a celebration. We're going to have this Eclipse Festival. On Sunday, the 7th of April from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., there's going to be speakers, there's going to be events, there's activities going on. There's going to be a meteorologist talking about the eclipse weather update for us. The Seymour High School Science Department will have a talk on telescopes, sun viewing, how to identify planets and stars during the eclipse, and possibly we'll see any comet during the eclipse. The Louisville Astronomical Society, they're going to be talking about amateur astronomy as a hobby. A local astrophotographer is going to have an astro astrophotography exhibit. The Seymour Boys and Girls Club is going to have a kids' corner with STEM activities and lots of other activities going on. The Southern Indiana TACO, if I pronounce that right, drum group will be doing a performance and workshop. The Seymour High School Music Department is going to be doing live music. And in honor of that, I'm wearing my Seymour Senior High School band sweatshirt from back in the 1960s when I was in the band. There'll be a talk on poets and politicians. There'll be a tribute to John Mellencamp. And there'll be food and arts and crafts vendors. And oh yeah, I'm gonna be giving a talk on eclipse astrophotography. I'll also be selling and signing my autobiography. Eclipse classes will be available to all the festival attendees. The main eclipse viewing site is gonna be at Freeman Municipal Airport. That's where uh, the Army Airfield was back during World War II. And there's a beautiful museum there. So if you're gonna be in Seymour for the eclipse, go check out the, uh, the Army Airfield Museum. Lots of great displays. 
I mean, food trucks and telescopes. There's a website that's still in work, SeymourEclipse.com. So check that out for updated information. And all of the activities will be free to everybody. So come on down. Great. So one last little point here. Um, turns out, I guess I'm old enough to be considered a museum piece. On Saturday, the 6th of April, I will be on display at the Seymour Museum Center of Indiana. I'll be doing book signings of my book, uh, my autobiography. So if you're in Seymour, come on over. A little gratuitous plug, that's the cover of my autobiography. It's available on Amazon, both in paperback and Kindle versions. But of course, come to see more and you can buy a copy and I'll sign it right there. So I wish everybody clear skies for next April. And of course, this Saturday for the uh, annular eclipse. It'll be partial here in Arizona. Uh, the sun will be, uh, sun diameter about 85% will be covered. So thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. I really appreciate it too, Mike. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation. It's going to be a great time in Indiana. You bet. So, awesome. Uh, we are now heading down to Brazil uh, to uh, Marcelo Souza, who was a big influence on uh, Anna Katarina. Uh, she she mentioned her, him uh, in her talk. Uh, when you go online onto our Global Star Party page, uh, you just go explorescientific.com forward slash GSP134. You can read about each one of the speakers that was on tonight, and uh, hopefully you uh, rewind uh, this this uh, particular um, Global Star Party to watch to rewatch some of the programs. I think you'll find them fascinating as you watch them again and again. Uh, Marcello, thank you for coming on to Global Star Party. What is going on in Brazil? Hi. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you, all of you. Uh, I, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, congratulations, you. Ana Catarina. Nice to see you here <laughs> and all of you. Uh, Ana Catarina, I think that she didn't say, but she... I also was uh, worked in a observatory in the United States during wow. one year in, at the University of, uh, University of Tarleton. She worked with Mike Hibbs, uh, studying asteroids there from the, um, this observatory. Hi, Professor. Sorry, hi, just to say, like, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to see you as well, as always. Um, but yes, so like, just to say also, like, as Kot was mentioning that, like, you're still my mentor. Um, that also happened after I met uh, Dr. Hibbs during an astronomy trip, astronomy club trip. I met him and uh, we talked about like these opportunities as well. So um, it's uh, it's funny how like Marcelo has been my mentor since I was 13 and, uh, you know, going forward. Yeah. Great, Catarina. Congratulations. Catarina now will be the next uh... PhD in biology, uh, and this is very important. This shows what that is important to develop the uh, outreach activities because astronomy is uh, that can motivate the students' interest for science. Uh, maybe they will not work with astronomy, but uh, they know how that the uh, uh, you can develop research, and you can, and they find found find the direction, right, right direction, the what motivated them. And congratulations, yeah. Catarina, for your success. And uh, uh, today I will tell a different history today, uh, because. Uh, it's associated, part of this history is associated with uh, annular eclipse. Now, that is what uh, will happen this Saturday. For us here, we will be a partial solar eclipse. Now, let me share here my screen. I don't know if uh, you know the history of this guy and uh, this person. I have here a script here with all the information because is a lot of information, but before I tell the history, I will show this maze that I think that are fantastic mazes. Right? 
that uh, I'm sorry for the dog here. <laughs> He's near. The dog is near me here. And uh, and uh, uh, here are the images of uh, a solar eclipse taken by the International Space Station in 2017. The same image. And they have a short video showing this. You can see the shadow here uh, on the surface of the Earth. The black circle here. The finger of God, that they call. Uh, you see the image from the space. That's something fantastic. You see this uh, image from space. It's an image that uh, uh, ever we make us to make a reflection about our life. Uh, mm -hmm. You see from space uh, the shadow of an eclipse, a total solar eclipse on the Earth surface. As the same that the astronauts see from the International Space Station. Uh, and here are some uh, pictures showing in the past how people react when he, they saw the, an eclipse, total solar eclipse. And this, that is a fantastic story, history, but it's not associated with a total solar eclipse, but with, with uh, lunar eclipse, total lunar eclipse. Columbus, when he arrived in Jamaica, in an effort to induce the natives of Jamaica to continue providing provisions for his crew, he used a total lunar eclipse of May, March 1st, uh, 154, uh, that in Jamaica was visible. Né? The day was February 29, because it was a uh, obsessed. I don't know how to say this year, this special year, if Fe uh, February has an. Another day in English, in Portuguese, is Bissexta, to intimidate them. Then the natives gave to him uh, everything he asked for. Right? He had two hours, I think, the one hour, right? one hour to that to to make the natives to do what he wants before the the moon, you know, the finish the the total lunar eclipse. Yeah, another. Image né? about the reaction about the uh, total solar eclipse is a French journal. And now it is about a flower. I, I, I don't know, I think that the name in, in English is hydrangea. Né? That means, that means, my daughter here, uh, that means uh, Hortensia. I don't know what is the name that he used in the United States, is, if it's hydrangea or hortensia, but it is associated with uh, astronomer. I don't know if, if you know that is associated with astronomer. The name of the flower uh, was after an astronomer, a French astronomer, in honor of her. And uh, I will tell, I will tell this history now, that uh, it's a fantastic history. These are the Hortensia, uh, and this is the, the French astronomer, Nicole Reine Etable Labrière Leput. Uh, she was married, I have audio information here. Uh, she was born in Paris, and she married the royal watchmaker, Jean-André Leput. And the, she added her surname here. And she, her husband met Jerome Lalande, that was the director. Uh, years after, she, he begins to be a director of the Paris Observatory. And the, she was a human computer. She was a fantastic mathematics. And she felt very motivated to work, to do all the calculus, to the development of clocks, uh, new kinds of clocks with uh, her husband. And also, she felt motivated 
to work with astronomy, to make all the, calcul the calculations about astronomy. And uh, she worked with uh, Lalande, and uh, she was responsible to make uh, a more accurate prediction about the return of the Halley comets. Hmm. And uh, she produced an almanac as, uh, that uh, all the information, ephemeris, from 1761 to 1769. This included an last solar eclipse in 1762. And what is the part of the history here? Also, she made the prediction of the transit of the Venus in 1761 that repeated eight years later in 1769. What is the importance of the transit of Venus? Because a person that is a, was a, a famous astronomer, that is Guilherme Legentil, he discovered, I think, that three or four objects from the Messier catalog, and uh, he was motivated to observe the transit of Venus. But he needed to travel to India to see the transit of Venus in 1761. Yeah. But uh, nothing worked as he planned. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, they call him that is the astronomer the bad luck astronomer. I don't know if it's correct in English, but astronomy is a uh, very bad luck. Yeah? That's uh, what happened with him. He traveled to see the transit of Venus in 1761, but uh, when he was traveling to a place that uh, belongs to France, belonged to France, then England take this land this region in India from French. Then he needed to change his plans and travel to a different region in India to see the eclipse, the transit of Venus. When he arrived in the place, uh, uh, he had problems to leave the boat and uh, he needed to make all the, to see the transit of Venus from inside the boat. Uh, then it wasn't possible for him to make the, all the measurements that he traveled to do. Then he begins to be very sad with this. As he needed to wait eight years for the next transit, he decided to stay there to see the next transit of Venus. Then he stayed eight years Far from French, uh, his wife uh, imagined that he was dead because he didn't send any information to his family. He was a member of the Royal uh, of the Academy of France, the Science of France. He lost the, his position in the Academy of France and he stayed eight years there. He did a, a lot of things in these eight years. He traveled to Philippines. And he, he was in jail there. Everything, a lot of things happened with him. And eight years later, he built an observatory to see the transit of Venus in 1769. Then, in the moment, during the moment of the transit of Venus, the sky was with a lot of clouds. And he lost the transit of Venus. He tried for two times and he, he didn't see and he didn't make the uh, measurements that he would like to do. Then after this, he was very sad and he, he began to return to France. But when he was returning to France, uh, on the ship Baudet's an expedition coordinated by Luis Bougainville, né? É, he brought with him a flower that uh, was not catalogued until then. And uh, he told his history about the eclipse, 
about the transit of Venus, Venus, and said that uh, who was the person that made all the calculations that he was trying to confirm with the measurement was the Nicole Rainy et al. Labriere Lepotes. And then the botanic gave the name of the flower Lepout in honor of the, this French astronomer, this woman. Later, they changed the name to Hortensia. And sometimes, uh, you have a history that they say that Hortense is also how they call it her. But uh, today they have, have doubts about this. But uh, originally was an, in honor of her, the name Lepout. Today they call Hydrangea. I don't know if it's correct in my English or what correct in what. But uh, anyway, this is the flower of astronomy. Here are uh, uh, Lep uh, Leput with uh, her husband. And in one of her, you have uh, a crater on the moon mm. right? that's called Leput in one of her. Here is the image of his almanac. Uh, and here is uh, the Guilherme Legentil, that he didn't made measurements that year. And he, uh, I, I know that you have a movie about his history because when he returned to France, his wife was married with another person. He lost his position in the academy, but he, after uh, a long uh, period, he returned with his position in the academy, and he is like a love story in like this movie. And here is the flower of astronomy, Hortensia. Right? We use it for, uh, as was uh, named in honor of uh, a French astronomer, Lepotes. And we are organizing many activities for the, here will be a partial, solar eclipse, but we are visiting schools, make presentations, and the, we already uh, gave for the student, for the population, 2,700 uh, glasses that was sent by Stephen Hamilton. Uh, and the, we are planning to uh, give more 1,500 glasses until the moment of eclipse. Now, I hope that the sky will be clear in the day, right? because it will be even a partial solar eclipse. If it is a very special moment. Thank you very much, Scott, for the invitation. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks again for a fantastic presentation, and uh, yeah. I'll have to remember those flowers. <laughs> yes, the flower of astronomy. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. So our next speaker is. Um, uh, Adrian Bradley. Adrian does uh, uh, poetic and amazing, often serene uh, images of the night sky against uh, the landscape, and sometimes with, uh, you know, even on cloudy nights, he uh, uh, finds uh, ways to weave in the Milky Way and uh, really capture our our hearts and imagination. Uh, Adrian, thanks for coming on to Global Star Party. And um, what do you have for us tonight? Well, thank you <clears throat> once again, Scott, <clears throat> for having me. And of course, if I had some water, I would have drunk it right there. <laughs> so, um, well, there's a couple of things that I wanted to go ahead and share. Um, we've had a great global star party. I've been listening the whole time. And um, there's been all sorts of um discussion regarding um you know our planet earth the theme that you set up for us um knowing our planet and it, it's it's near and dear to my heart because part of the reason that i decided to stay in doing a lot of wide field uh landscape astrophotography it's is it's called or nightscapes um i looked up a definition of astronomy 
and it you know it pertained to everything off of earth but our our own planet is in space that uh that image of pale blue dot that uh carl sagan um you know talked um saying talked over sounds like it's uh you know it you know it basically told us this is the only home that we've ever known we are a part of space we are in a family of planets in a solar system orbiting our own star and um so when shooting images in the night sky we do it from the vantage point of earth which is also you know a part of this universe so i figure earth is always visible in most of my shots so what i want to do first is share a little bit of my eclipse memories and then i'll share some of what i've been working on um to close down um this uh 134th global star party um of course i'm not here with my partner in crime john schwartz but i do have an image um i had an image for him but i'll just have to share it to the rest of you all um uh, at the end of the presentation so i'll start with sharing my screen and i forgot to share i'm gonna stop it because i forgot to share audio there is an audio portion but it won't be music this it won't be music scott it'll okay let's see share sound i'll optimize for video clip that may help okay so so here we are sharing what for most folks when partial eclipses are happening when we're headed to totality this may be a familiar sight you start doing things with uh where you create shadows and you can create the um little crescents that come because the sun the sun casts crescent shadows um it's fair to warn you that if you do not use protective gear your each one of those little crescents well you'll have one in each eye uh your cornea being burned out because the power of the sun's rays even when partially blocked by the moon is still strong enough to blind um or you know that hole that uh someone uh was discussing maybe it was uh it was either maxi or cesar who said that they had the cesar amateur astronomer came in and said he had his uh badge of honor a little dark spot in his vision due to looking at the uh eclipse before it went total looking at it with uh number 14 welder's glass and still that not being enough to block the uh rays coming from the sun so this picture these pictures here are pictures i collected in 2017 some are my own many are my own but some are fantastic pictures taken by uh, other photographers that shared the images with me. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't at least acknowledge, I don't have their names. They This particular sequence was an excellent sequence shared with me um, while we were here. I had the telescopes, both telescopes going. My children were out here. I was most glad that I had my children here at this eclipse party. We were down in um, White House, Tennessee. This is at that in 2017, that was the center line. Now we've learned where the center line will be for this eclipse coming up. <clears throat> Those of us in Michigan are just gonna miss the center line. There may be somewhere near this border that gets to see totality for a brief couple of seconds. But Cleveland gets to see it. There's a spot in Canada that sits out over Lake Erie and is in the path of totality. You just heard about Indiana, which is somewhere over here. If we look for the lines, here's Indiana, and this is where totality comes. So totality is going to shoot through here, come to the north of Ohio, and out that way it comes down indiana and down toward the south towards illinois um 
So that's where you'll want to be in April. As far as this weekend goes, you just want to be somewhere where it's not cloudy. In some places, this is as far as you will get. In other places, you may get even less. You may get a sliver of the uh, moon being taken out. Some thoughts on capturing totality. This was before I took up photography in earnest. So this was my feeble attempt at capturing totality. Now, what I saw through the eyepiece in my 11-inch scope, it's worth, if you're a visual astronomer and you have at least a 10-inch or 11 inches of aperture or more, you will see some amazing things. I mean, there are prominences you'll see um, during totality. You'll see these lines as well. You know, the, we all drew lines coming around the stars. Maybe it was our innate way of describing light emanating from the sun. Well, um, I heard a podcast where Dr. Pamela Gay basically mentioned those lines are for real. And yes, you do see those lines if you examine the corona using a uh, telescope. It's quite a sight. And um, you'll hear me t mentioning that. Um, the other thing I'll mention before I play this video that I captured, um, it was about a one minute video during totality. And I'll play that for you. For those that have never seen totality, this is what it's like. You, it's dusk and plant life shuts down, animal life shuts down. This is the behavior of plants and animals basically does what it does at dusk. You've got that salmon color. The difference is now with a real sunset, you'll see that color opposite the sun wherever the sun is or you'll see it when the sun goes below horizon during a total solar eclipse it's around the entire horizon the entire horizon gets thrown in a sunset so this picture thanks to the photographer who took this my goal is to recreate an image similar to this maybe showing a little more detail of totality it may be difficult the brightness of totality tends to I've heard about the brightness of a full moon. So we will be putting that to the test as we take a few. Once totality comes, the goal is to take a few pictures. I've taken full moon shots handheld, and I would be taking shots of totality handheld and hopefully getting some decent uh, shots while remembering to stop and look at it with the eyes. So. A big part of being at a total solar eclipse event, if you're invited to one, I would go because being there with the people and experiencing totality is a wonderful thing. So let me go ahead and play in you know, this picture someone sent to me. That's as close as it gets to showing what it's like looking up at the and an eclipse sun. It is truly, it's a breathtaking event. And even though you know what's going on, it is still, you know, there's still a lot of wonder and there's still, you're still sort of wondering, you know, if I didn't know the science behind this or, you know, have any kind of uh, warning, I might feel like something terrible is about to happen because the sun is gone. And there's, you know, the corona is out there, but it is it is truly a beautiful and marvelous event. So hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Scott, just let me know if you can't hear it. This is a video while totality is happening. Oh! Oh, wow. I gotta let look you guys see this. Still not getting good pictures through the. Uh... Go look on his phone. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You're here first. So are you out, Mom, guys, are guys able to hear the corner. video through Zoom or Mom. hear the audio? Well, just take a quick peek of that. I don't have it full on, but just take a look at that. 
I don't want to hog that because yeah. it's time is. Okay. Oh. I'm just Mom, not steady enough. Jupiter. That one is. Hey, that one's either Mercury or Mars. I'm not sure which. Yeah, it's either Mercury or Mars. I'm not sure which. Over there. Oh, Jupiter. That one looks red. Yeah, it does. We're near the end. All right, Garrett and Richard. Get a photo in this one right now. Okay. You can see prominences off of the sun if you look at it. Now it stops the there. Um, there's a longer video that there's a longer video that shows that phase where the where the eclipse where the eclipse ends and the diamond ring phase comes out. I would have to go ahead and find it. Um, if I um, wanted to show that, but a few other notes to share. Um, here's Justin Florowski. If you look him up, he shared his work. This was an, this was a, an amazing photo of um, you know from Total Sun to these phases totality in the middle now what's interesting is if you're not you know if you're not in the path of totality you stop somewhere along here and you go to the opposite side and the moon retreats depending on what part of the earth you're in um detroit michigan you'll go all the way around to here maybe even closer but then the um you know, the moon will retreat. You don't get to see totality. So it's very much worth looking at totality if you can. Really quick, the story of these six gentlemen, none of them, these are veterans. None of them really cared that totality happened the other day. They were living their lives. Um, when we do outreach, sometimes we're going to deal with people that are concerned with their everyday living. Um you know, for the for the things that these gentlemen have seen, um, you know, they they may be happy that they're just still getting together. You know, they were they were in Nashville, which was in the path of totality. Now, one thing problem with Nashville is that the cloud came over and covered totality. So there must not have been much for them to see if they did look up. They just noticed it got dark. And uh, I had a wonderful chat with him. Um, I think you you may recognize this image. That may be Maxie's that he shared. And there's another diamond ring image. But um, yeah, it's truly a wonderful sight and definitely worth um, going to see. Now, before I end this, um, Scott, mm -hmm. this isn't... This is sort of the ode to uh, John Schwartz, because what I found is if you take an iPhone yeah. and you take a night scene or, you know, nautical twilight heading towards heading towards astronomical twilight, and you take a picture. If you extend the length of the um, exposure in night mode, you get what looks like a painting. And I found that to be a really interesting effect, especially with Beautiful. this photo as well. The the thought Bob Ross comes to mind, but I think Bob Ross would have painted this even smoother. But um, that's an interesting effect when it comes to um, using the iPhone camera to take photos. I mean, the lack of detail creates this painterly look to a photo and i found that very very interesting so that's more that i have to experiment with and then as far as what i'm working on now um here you've got all these photos 
And in every last one of them, if you ask, well, where is the earth? That's the scene below. So a third of the picture, at least, of all my wide field landscapes will contain, um, they will contain the planet earth on them. And uh, there will, I also try and capture looking up at the night sky. Um, this image gives you that feeling of, that you're standing there and you're, and you see this aurora in the distance. You see the truth. This is exactly what you see, except that it's maybe not as bright. Um, the aurora, when it's distant aurora, it isn't quite as bright as this. These colors don't show up, but you do see something going on in the distance and you see all of these stars. And when one of the reasons for capturing it like that is because it's absolutely beautiful. You can turn around and you see this lighthouse and you see even more stars. Um you know, yeah, Aurora like to the, the north the and Milky Way is spewing forth from the uh, light tower. It's really beautiful. Yes, it is. And that was one of the reasons I like I've sold that picture. Um, this is even more of a Milky Way spewing. Yeah. You know, the light from the lighthouse is spewing out this way. Yeah, it's kind of metaphorical um, and it's beautiful. And um, yeah, all composed. It, Good job, Adrian. Yeah. So not all images work out um the uh where is it last two images may not have turned out as well as i had hoped trying to stack images but the idea was to try and stack the stack 20 images together and see if I got more of the Cygnus region as its setting. Here, Cygnus, there is a cloud that ended up, I ended up getting this fanning of the night sky because there were clouds in it. So, cool. so there's going to have to be some more to think about and maybe consider doing longer exposures and composites instead when it when it's cloudy because the stacking puts all of the it puts the stars together it's great but it also creates an interesting uh effect here that i may not have wanted and finally this would be my light pollution entry that's ann arbor michigan and it's being added to by the um rising moon over here which I've done a little bit better in the past of getting the rising moon to show the way that we see it. My goal is always to share the night sky as I see it, the at least the earth as it appears to our eyes. We see more than a camera exposed. The camera has to be exposed either for the ground or for the sky, and it's very difficult to do both especially with different lighting conditions. But that's the challenge that I take up because the goal is to share the night sky the way it looks no matter what's in the sky um, and be able to present that um, to viewers. It's a challenge putting images together like that. But once you do, it's remarkable how you can, it enables people to travel with you to these various sites, whether you want to be there by yourself or not, you hear coyotes in the distance and you hope they don't come close. Um, the only thing that I can't show is that sound, but I can show what it's like to look out there. And that's, that's why I do it. And Scott, I'm going to stop sharing, turn it back over. I think okay. it's just you, me and uh, Marcello. Marcelo or left more, there's more there yeah but uh yeah I do want to um I want to uh uh thank all the presenters tonight um that uh we're on the 134th global star party uh we will um uh, uh be taking a pause from global star party because we have an annular eclipse coming up I have a trip uh 
uh, to um, uh, overseas, and I need to uh, make that trip. Um, but uh, we will be back, uh, of course, and uh, uh, marching towards uh, uh, a very special 150th Global Star Party, uh, which I look forward to as well. But um, um, you guys are a fantastic audience. We have uh, fantastic uh, presenters uh, of all ages. And uh, uh, let me just bring everyone on that's uh, still got their cameras on here. We've got, uh, of course, Adrian uh, Marcello Souza, Kate, Caitlin Goulet, and uh, Anna Katerina uh, Avila. And I really appreciate everyone um, being here with us and um, so, uh, as, uh, as our, uh, my good friend Jack Horkheimer always used to say, uh, keep looking up and, um, uh, you know, I wish that all of you get uh, a piece of this uh, uh, annular eclipse that uh, is coming and, um, um, uh, and you need to get ready for the total eclipse if you're anywhere near the path, uh, get there. Uh, yes. Seeing a total eclipse will just blow your mind. So uh, we will see you on the next Global Star Party. Take care. Come all to the Southern Cross Astronomical Society's 2024 Winter Star Party. Celebrating 40 years of stargazing. Happening from February 5th through the 11th, 2024 on Scout Key in the beautiful Florida Keys. Get away from the cold and adjust your latitude underneath the pristine skies of Southern Florida with breathtaking views of Eta Carina, the Jewel Box, the Southern Cross, Centaurus A, and of course, the magnificent Omega Centauri. Tickets will go on sale on or about October 1, 2023 at SCAS.org. See you there! Are your Eclipse glasses safe for looking at the sun? Let's check to see if your Eclipse glasses can handle the heat or if they need to stay inside. First off, never check your Eclipse glasses with the sun. That's a good way to injure your eyes. Take your Eclipse glasses and find a bright light, like a lamp or a flashlight. Hold your Eclipse glasses up to the light and look through them. The light will appear extremely dim or not appear at all when looking through the glasses. For example, you should only be able to see the filament of a light bulb, but not the glow surrounding the bulb. Also, if your Eclipse glasses have any marks or scratches on them, don't use them. If you have older Eclipse glasses from a previous Eclipse, give them the check to make sure they haven't been damaged or scratched. All safe Eclipse glasses will meet the ISO 12312-2 standard. It's best to store Eclipse glasses in a safe place where they won't become scratched or punctured. Remember, never look at the sun without Eclipse glasses or a solar filter. Be safe and happy sun viewing, everyone.
Argus is on a mission to create smart, sustainable accessories to empower you to do more by using less. Sustainability shouldn't be a barrier to tech. It should be seamlessly integrated with how we work, play, and live. That's why we're on a journey to create a suite of tech accessories where smart design and sustainability are inextricably linked. We're doing more, designing smarter, training bigger, and using less. Introducing the EcoSmart range of bags and accessories, a collection of products that not only puts the planet and people first by using a host of eco-friendly innovations and materials, but enables you to do more with your device while protecting and empowering your future. It's our planet, your future. Together with Targus, you've got this.